hearing for a site plan greater than 2,000 square feet of new construction by Michael George to modify expand structure at a non-conforming side setback at 187 Locust Street, Florence, map ID 23B-89. And I see Michael George here, and perhaps you have some colleagues, if you want to give us a little presentation, that would be great. Sure. Um, it's just me. Um, Carolyn um, has offered to help me with the screen share because I don't know how to do that. Um, so uh, my name is Michael George. I am in the process of purchasing 187 Locust Street. Um, Myself and my two brothers, we own and run George Propane in Goshen. Um, and we are, what I'm planning to do is convert the first floor of the property to office space in the front and um, trade space in the back associated with live work. Um, and then add two floors of residential. Um, and um, I, my wife and I would be living in the second and third floor, the residential space. Um, and um, let's see, I have two, um, we have sort of two options for the, the way we, you know, the, the site plan layout. Um, one is if we use the existing footprint in the existing building and uh, put two additions on, one in the rear and one on the right-hand side. Um, and this one on the screen now is option two where we, um, if the if the current structure is not uh, if it if it's it's not feasible to put two floors of residential on top of it and reinforce it, we would demo and um, basically use the same almost the same footprint, but just move everything back ten feet. Um, the setback on the west side would stay the same at seven feet. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, like I said, the difference between option one and option two is option one, same building, same footprint with the um, existing footprint, addition on the back and addition on the um, east. Are you able to show that one, Carolyn? Um, yeah, so this is your, this is with option two. Right. So you want the one you, and then, um, Otherwise, it's the existing building here. Let me just grab the other view. Um, sorry here, oops. Uh, this is getting confusing. I have too many windy, windows open. Um, well, don't, I mean, it's pretty. Just to, yeah, uh, oh, sorry, I had it up. I have it up on one of these other tabs. I'm just, Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, okay, so uh, um, I pulled actually one of the original ones up that just so shows the garage. So I'm just trying to find the other one, I'm sorry. Um, Okay, here it is. Um, there, all right. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, there it is. Great. So, thank you. Yep. Um, so this would be option one, um, where we were using the existing building, reinforcing it, and then um, putting an addition on the back, an addition on the right. Uh, essentially the same, you know, like I said, option two is the same sort of footprint layout, just move back 10 feet. Um, in option one, we'd be asking for a, a reduction in the off street parking requirements from four to three, um, because we wouldn't have room really in the front for two parking spots. In option two, we would not be asking for that. We would have, uh, be able to get two parking spots in the front. Um, we are planning to Plant three trees in the front there, 
put a bike rack in. Um, the green space or open space would, right now it's about 29%. And I think in both options, it would be over 55%, between 54% with option two, 59% with option one. Um, because the parking is sort of haphazard and gravel. And so we, you know, sort of define that and pave the parking areas and, and turn the, the main, most of the back into just green space and lawn and landscaping. Um, and I think we would meet all the site plan requirements other than that one parking reduction we're asking for. Um, and I think that's, I think that's all I have, unless there's questions. I'm not very good at this. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. George. So far, so good. So yeah, now we'll we'll turn it over to the members of the planning board to see if any of them have questions. Um, and after a few of those, then we'll turn it over if there's any public who wants to comment, um, neighbors or butters. Um, so I have a question, George. Um, the <clears throat> so you're proposing, Mr. George, three parking places for the total project. Yeah, with the first option, we'd be proposing three parking spaces. Two would be in a, in a garage inside on the first floor, um, two garage parking spaces for the residential, and then one parking space in the front for the office space. Um, we'd be short a space for what I guess we're, I'm calling the trade space in the back, which would be associated with live work. It'd be sort of my space, but I'd have a space in the garage. So if two people showed up to go to the business that it's on the first floor, where mm -hmm. would the second one park? Um, there's, um, if you look sort of, if you pulled in the driveway and went straight ahead, I guess you could call that an informal parking space spot. Um, I don't know if, um, if you'd have just, there's only 23 feet there from the the parking over to the garage area so you'd have to squeak around there if you're going to turn around but i'm not clear there is a second there, park place there's only the there's only one parking space in the front right now for that office space in the front and so there would it. or would not be a second one in back there would not be so since there's no parking on um, and, um, uh, and I'm sorry, hello? Yep. Since there's no parking at all on Locust Street and neither of the neighbors will allow parking, presumably, where would they go? They would park in that spot straight ahead as you pulled in. If you see where, if you pull, I'm not sure, right there. That's a, that is not a, like a conforming parking space, but we left it so that's the same size of a parking space because that's where we would have to push snow and, and give room if you were coming, backing out of the garage to sort of back out. So there is that spot that they could park in. They just would have a little bit of difficulty if they went to back out of there only got 23 feet instead of 28 feet. Can you park on the street there? You cannot. Well, thank you, Alan. Yeah, that is a little problematic because then uh, a second or a third car that comes into that office area, or even if you have a visitor to your trades room, um, they may end up kind of backing out onto Locust, which is certainly kind of a hazardous situation. Not that that wasn't done when it was a busy lawnmower shop and it was another, um, but it's not something I think we would want to plan for. Right. I mean, we don't expect um, foot traffic or, um, I mean, the, the office space in the front would be for one of my employees. So they really wouldn't be expecting or having visitors, they'd be one employee there parking in that front space. Um, Ida can also say, you know, if you look, there is a, it's a very wide driveway entrance. So um, there would be potential for doing a three point turn to come face out instead of backing out. So you're, and you're, and 
in terms of the parking requirements, because it's live work, it's sort of a shared parking space that would be required for that for the residential component. So um, there, <clears throat> excuse me, so that gives um, a, additional, I think, comfort level for the planning board um, and the fact that the driveway is um, substantially wider than most um, driveways. I mean, at that one section, it's 29 feet across. That's wider than a street. Carolyn, is with the live work space, that's a allowed as a matter of right in this zone? Yes. So what if um, the uh, one or the other what moved? I mean, what, what if the what if it no longer was live workspace? The same people that they could be rented to two residential tenants and one or more commercial tenant. Well, it's only um, going to be it's only one residential space. So it's not going to be two residential tenants uh, or spaces. Um, there are still there's there's two um, parking spaces in the garage, but you still have this one space at the end, the butt end, the twenty four the twenty foot long um, space there. So um, you know it's it's. Um, they would still be technically one uh, parking spot shy, but that would be a management issue on the site to try to figure out how, you know, people came in and out of the site. Well, I get, I, yeah, I get that, but I'm also wondering what if, is there any enforcement or compliance uh, provision to? ensure that the same person is living and working in, in both spaces? No. You would grant a permit for a reduction of parking for the site. Um, the, one of the reasons you would do that is because it has the, because it's built as a live work space, I mean, it has to meet the building codes for that purpose. Um, but no, there's no enforcement with um, capacity to to manage that. Okay. Other questions from the board members? It's um, I see we're gaining some green space here, which prior to this had been right a lot of gravel out front, kind of unappetizing, and in the back all gravel. So. That's a, a that's a plus, um, Mr. George. I know that you've also um, worked out an arrangement with your abutter, the Northampton Pediatrics, to take down some large locusts between your building and theirs. Yes. Um, now, Carolyn, I think when we approved that plan for Northampton Pediatrics, there was kind of a little trade-off that they were then going to plant some other trees to make up for that loss. Um, what happens to that kind of negotiated arrangement if this new applicant takes down those trees and it's not his property? So the tree removal is all, I mean, the permit that was granted for Northampton Area Pediatrics stays with Northampton Pediatrics. It doesn't matter who takes the trees down. Um, so it's still on their permit because it's on their property. But Northampton Pediatrics hasn't moved forward with their project. If he takes the trees down and they don't move forward with the project, we're not going to have any replacement trees. Um, uh, that potentially is um, could be an issue. I don't know that I I don't I don't know why they wouldn't move forward with their project. Um, they've been um needing parking for a while um <clears throat> but um yeah i mean if if um they are putting three trees in the front i don't know how that counts or um, 
Oh. Right. That's just as, as part of their permit. So once they move forward and construct, then they would be required to put those trees in. Um, and that's typically how you, you know, the permit path is, is, um, is followed. Um, you know, I think um, that I suppose, I mean, you could ask for more trees to be planted on the site in the event that this doesn't, um, that Northampton Area Pediatrics doesn't move forward. Um, you know, uh, but I think, um, you know, we haven't really run across this before and given the permit was already granted for the butter and, and they were taking those trees down. Um, if, you know, I think it's a pretty good chance that's going to happen. I mean, and the reason I want to take them down is not just to take them down there. I mean, if you did a site visit, you could see, but they're, they're overhanging like right on top of the building. So it's more of a hazard issue than I just didn't want to take them down just to get light in there. That, you know, that was the only reason I want to take them down. Thank you. I, yeah, I understand that, but there they are there are four big, very mature trees, and they do have a benefit. Um, granted, there's more wooded area around behind the property in question, but uh, boy, um, it, it's it's just very possible that uh, pediatrics won't move forward. And uh, I don't know. Is it possible to condition that if pediatrics does not move forward and <sighs> I don't know how we would do that. Ask them to plant the replacement trees along the street front. Um, I forget exactly the conditions of that permit, where the plantings were going to be. Well, there's um, an option. You don't have to plant them all on site because if you don't have room, right. then you have the ability to make a payment into the fund. So, right. um, um, it, there could be a condition about the tree replacement um, evaluation at the end of the certificate of occupancy, at the time of certificate of occupancy for this new building, um, we could look at the time tolling. Uh, I can take a look at the permit while you, if there are public comments or other board members who wanna talk about other issues, I can look up the, um, uh, the timeline for the permit for pediatrics. There's a three year window in which to substantially start a project. So. Otherwise, they need to come back. So if the project's not completed within three years, or started, I'm sorry, within three years of the permit, um, I think we're only one year in, but I can check. Um, then you could do a condition about paying into the tree fund for the trees that are removed. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I guess neither the applicant nor pediatrics want any... Uh any other plantings along this uh, property line, this buffer line? Because um, perhaps there could be some smaller species that could be planted there that wouldn't create the same kind of has hazard to Mr. George's property. Uh, but that I guess is something that would need to be worked out with the pediatrics. Yeah, I mean, I, I have no problem planting some smaller, you know, tree species, whatever, but I think they're, because of the, we're so close to the property line and I think their plan brings their parking lot almost right up to it. I don't know if there'd be any room. No. Okie doke. All right, I don't wanna belabor this, but it's just a very unusual situation. Those are mature trees, we're losing them and there's a possibility that they won't have the replacement that we usually ask for, whether it's payment into the Northampton Tree Fund or replacement on site, so. Um, what is the setback there? Uh, seven feet. Hmm. What is the like tree? I mean, not to, if I have to do this later, that's fine. How does the tree fund calculation, what's the formula for that? Um, that it's based on the total inches removed. So on your plan, you're showing three trees that are the total of 60 inches you'd be required or the owner is required to replace 30 inches worth of trees. 
you're planting six along the front. So that would leave you with 24 inches um, potentially. So then you could either pay for 24 inches to be um, a payment into the tree planting fund in which the city then would uh, plant trees in the public way or on public spaces around the city or in public rights of way. Okay. Okie doke, well, let's, let's come back to that then if it needs to be some kind of condition or we all might agree that uh, we trust that North Anta Pediatrics is gonna continue with their work. Um, any other questions from board members on the plans in front of us? Okay, well, why don't we open it up to the public? Um, is there anyone out there who would like to speak either in favor or against the uh, application here? Aha. Uh -huh. All right. Um, I'm Benjamin Barnes, but I'm here for a later hearing. I just came early because I wasn't confident I was proficient with the technology. Thank you, no Mr. Comments, Barnes. No comments on this one. Okay, your technology is working well. Um, okay, let's go back to the planning board then. Um, before we close the public hearing, and then we won't be able to ask the applicant any questions. Are there any other questions? Any other clarifications? I don't have a question. I just want to say I'm, um, I think the insufficient parking is um, of concern, especially given that there's absolutely no parking on the street. I mean, there's absolutely no parking anywhere in the vicinity. Yep. Mr. George, did you by any chance have a, a discussion with either of your butters about using their parking lot for a space or two? No, I, did, I just, that kind of thing never works out. Um, uh -huh. You know what I mean? It, all it takes is somebody to get upset with somebody else. So, I mean, it's only, you know, obviously I'm going to live there. So that's important to me to have enough parking. Yeah. And one option we have enough parking. If we go with option two, where we end up demoing and moving back, we have enough parking. And I'm confident with option one, with that informal space, there's plenty of room because you're going to have a space there. We're calling it an informal space, but there's plenty of room to pull forward. You've got a spot you can park. You're out of the way of the traffic and back out and, and you know, back around and you might have to go one extra turn um, and you're out. Um, you're driving out and be me, my wife, my employees. So, you know, I can't imagine, I, I guess I can't imagine, I wouldn't wanna, um, I guess common sense would dictate you wouldn't back out under Route 9. But after you push the snow back there, um, the parking place kind of goes away. Yeah, but that's why we've got room beyond that. That's why we, you know, I mean, if we wanted to, I guess we could, take that space that's all informal gravel and put another spot back there. But we thought it was more important to have restored green space than to put another spot back there. I mean, we got the plantings there, so we're gonna have enough room. We're gonna have 20 plus feet where you can push snow back and then still get a car in there. It, it seems to me that you could park 10 to 12 cars here if you wanted to. I don't see what, what's the problem here. It's a very large, I mean, I got yeah, I mean, this is a lot of space. Why are, we, why are we bothering him about this? Well, be, because I, I think, David, they're parking in the driveway, so you can't line up 10 or 12 cars um, that don't have room to parallel park and come in and come out. They're not but it's not be, a retail, it's, it's not, not a retail, retail business, yeah, and it's not... Uh, you know, I, I, I think it's unlikely given the, the use that's proposed that that it's i mean hypothetically you could put 10 or 12 there I, I i don't think the use proposed is is likely to you know engender that kind of use like if we had like obviously if we had you know um 
typically the overflow parking would be at opposite times because there would be no people there or employees or people I work with at times we may have guests in the evening or weekends. But if we did have an occasion where we knew we were going to have something, of course, we would ask the vet or the pediatrician if we could use there. We would rather do that than put 10 or 12 cars and then back out. Um, I have a good relationship with them. I've talked to them. They're supportive of our project. I'm just saying I don't think it's a good idea for me to count on that um, to get into, you know, to, I don't think it would, they would be interested in doing that either to have like a agreement that I get parking space from them. I think just being a good neighbor and asking when needed is the best plan. Okay. All right. Anyone else on that parking item? Okay, I don't think there Can were I just any- just clarify, we're not being asked to waive, or we are being asked to waive the parking requirement for four spaces, is that right? <clears throat> there are two options. Option one would be to keep the building and build two floors above. And in that scenario, um, that's where parking, um, the request for reduction in one space is being made. Option two is to demo the building and slide the footprint back um, enough so that two parking spaces could be in front. And so he's asking for the flexibility for both of those options, given there's quite a bit of pay, um, paved space there um, and that it's a live work um, situation. Um, I think it does meet the require the criteria in the zoning for a request um, for reduction in parking, but that's you know up to the board to um, to determine. So procedurally, do we take one vote or two votes? Um, it, well, you're you can you can do either one. You can say that you're approving the site plan with for both options, or you can take a vote individually for option one versus option two. Uh, basically, as I'm sitting here in the parking lot, uh, Wayne texts me saying he has to run and... Krista, was that you? Yeah. Carolyn, the, no. the... The spot in option, I forget which is which is option. Option two is the one with the green lawn on it, I guess. Um, is there is that space that we're calling it an informal parking lot? Does that not count as a parking spot by the as off street parking? Um, I'm gonna pull no, up the street because I think I think David the garage opened up into that space. So the two cars come in and out right there. Yeah, but the t there's a 20 foot by 13 foot spot in the back back there next to the little addition there. All right. All right. So I'm, I'll just pull um, this up again. No, but that's in front of the garage doors. Yeah, I think to count formally, you'd need 28 feet and we've only got 23. When you back out of that spot that's straight ahead, you can share, if I read the regulations right, you can share that space to back out, um, but you need a clear 28. And I think we've only got 23. So be short um, a, a few feet, but there's plenty of room to back out with a couple turns and get back out of there. And also like, you know, as you pull in, you could park, if you had to multiple cars on the right-hand side and you still got almost 13 or so feet past it to drive past it. Right. And, and, and actually, in the front, if we absolutely had to, if we went with option number one, and we took the sidewalk and like, you know, made it small, and we could probably squeeze in two minimum criteria parking spaces in the front if we had to, but I just, I don't know, it, it shortens everything up. It's so tight to the front that I thought it was much better to go with one parking spot that is plenty big enough and ask for a reduction, even considering we have plenty of room to turn around and we have the informal spot. Yeah, I think as it is, we've got a sea of, uh, we've got a sea of asphalt next to this building. It seems silly to ask for more. I think 
part of what we look at as a planning board is if down the road the the, the businesses do change, you know, the residences do change. But I guess uh, someone else looking at this building who has a lot of parking needs would be stymied and they would look elsewhere. So but if someone asked for a retail, it would be a different. It would have to come back. Right. Well, retail's not, even not retail, allowed but... actually in this district. Right. Okay. Okay, um, I would I would suggest that we try to do this in one motion rather than two, um, for option A and option B. I guess it'll take some time for the applicant to find out whether structurally the building will support a second floor. Um, I wish that had done before this application, so it would be a little bit straightforward for us. But I understand sometimes that takes time. Um, and also just to clarify that I did look at the um, pediatrics permit. It was granted in September of 2018. So it's, it's past the second year. So um, September of 2021 would be three years. So at the end of September next year, if the applicant doesn't come back for an amendment, they would have to come back come back, through. I mean, the, the permit expires unless they come back for another round. So that's really just in September. Um, so if you wanted to put a permit condition that by the certificate of occupancy for this, then, you know, if the other application has not moved forward and it's expired, then you could do a condition for a tree replacement for those trees. And that condition would apply to uh, today's applicant, Mr. George, not the pediatrics, right? Right, if he's taking the trees <clears throat> down and that project isn't moving forward. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Any other questions for the board before we close the public hearing? <laughs> All right. Is there a motion to close the public hearing? I move to close the public hearing. Uh, I have a question. I'm sorry. I'm just coming in late. But is this the public hearing on the new way homes, or is this a different issue? Hi, Ms. McDermott. No, this is uh, on Locust Street. Thank you. Not, oh, we're sorry. not up, up to federal yet. Okay. I was worried I had missed it. No. Thanks. Okay, doke. So Jan has mo uh, moved to close the public hearing. Is there a second? I second. Thank you. Any discussion about closing a public hearing? All right. <clears throat> and as we do on Zoom, it's a little boring, but we have to go through a roll call. So we'll start on, uh, if I would, all those, that, uh, are you in favor or against the closing of public hearing? Melissa? Four. All right, David? Thumbs yes. up? Yes, yes, sorry. Okay. Alan. Yes. All right, Sam. Yes. Good to see you, Sam. Marissa. Yes. Jana. Yes. Krista. Yes. And George, yes, so unanimous. All right, so we have no more questions from the public or to our applicant. So um, the, old, the only other conditions besides the one about the tree and perhaps a, um, a discussion about approving the waiver is the uh, Board of Public Works, the Department of Public Works mentioned that the plans need to have the sewer lines and water lines noted on the final plans. I'm sure Mr. George saw that. Yep. Right, yes. Carolyn? And then we're suggesting a uh, condition about um, the trees that are being removed, if in fact the pediatrics doesn't move forward on their on their um, project to uh, expand their parking lot, and and during that project they would add more street trees and trees on their property, and then this applicant will take that on by by the the uh, the time when the occupancy mm -hmm. permit is given to Mr. George. If that is not cleared up, he will take responsibility for either paying into the tree fund or mm -hmm. planting trees on his site. And Carolyn, you could probably word that a lot better than I did. I, you know. Okay. 
So again, there is a suggestion that we try to make this in one motion. Does somebody feel confident enough to do that? I'll give it a go. Uh, I move to approve the uh, site plan greater than 2,000 square feet of new construction by uh, Michael George to modify or expand the structure uh, at a non-conforming side setback at 187 Locust Street, Florence, map ID 23B-89 with the conditions so specified. Second. Who was that? Me. Oh, thanks, Melissa. And just to clarify within this motion, we're um, allowing these two options to go forward. Yes, I think the modify slash expand. Okay. Uh, hope covers that. That's what okay. my, was my intention anyway. Great. Thank you, Jana. So the motion's been made and seconded. Any more discussion? Okay, with that, we'll go through the roll, the roll again. We'll start up top with Melissa. Yes. Yes, and David. Yes. Alan. Um, yes. Sam. <laughs> Sam Taylor. Do you approve of the motion? All right. Mm -hmm. Marissa. Yes. Dana. Yes. And Krista. Yes. Okay. And the George says yes also, so it's unanimous. Well, thank you, Mr. George, for your application. Good luck on this project. Um, thank you. Okay, anything else on that one, Carolyn? Um, uh, no. Well then. We will move forward to our 715 public hearing for site plan by Jeffrey Bott for more than 2,000 square feet of construction at 3 Maple Street, Florence, map ID 23A-287. Is the applicant here with a presentation for us? I am. Jeffrey Bott. Uh and do you need, do you want me to throw, put your plans up on the if screen again? Put the site plan up, that'd be great. Yeah. So, um, do you all see that? Mm -hmm. that's, okay. that's the existing conditions right now. Um, I'm working with Michael Wade, who owns the piece of property there. Currently, there's a four family house on the property. He would like to build an accessible single family house, small, 1,260 square feet, um, looking towards the future of aging in place, I guess, and a storage building. Um, the property had been or is listed as commercial or industrial, and um, we asked for a waiver from the zoning board to continue the non-conforming use of residential. It's a pretty much a residential neighborhood that it's in. And um, the new addition of the house and the storage shed would only bring the existing lot coverage up to 31%. So there's still a lot of open space on the lot. We would be adding trees along the property line on the outside where there are none at present. There are no other trees on the property. It's a grassy site. Um, Carolyn could show some of the pictures of what the site actually looks like if you didn't have a chance to look at them in the beginning. Um, they're off to the side there, I believe. And um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, that's the existing four family house on the lot. There's a parking lot next to it. And then up the street are some single family houses, or if you look down Riverside Drive, there are some other um, single family houses down to Landry Street. Um, and um, we're going to 
diminish the size of the parking lot a little bit because it's just sort of ramshackled and big um, to um, make just enough spaces for the new house and the four family apartment. That's, that's where the new house would be um, on the left hand side, on the right hand side of that photograph at the top of the hill. At the bottom of the hill would be some gardens, um, which Mike hopes to put in some raised beds. So again, they could be accessible to somebody who's challenged getting around. So it's, um, again, it's, it's not very complicated. So any That's it from above. The two X's represent the location of the house and the storage um, building. And uh, the rest of that wooded area is um, actually belongs to the medical building or the, it's not the medical, it's not a medical building, but it's a condominium of offices. And it's um, probably never going to be developed. I'm not sure, but it's, uh, it's wet in there. So probably won't. And that's Landry Street, um, where they're adding a number of, they're taking down a house on Landry Street, and they're going to put in more houses there. Uh, so it's, it's pretty much a residential area. Um, well, thank you. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> Carolyn, was uh, the applicant able to see the comments from the Department of Public Works? I excuse, I, I did see them. I've got okay. them in front of me, and they generally refer to um, the utility. You know, some clarification on my well, grade <laughs> and um, yeah, so on. Right. Things that I would address as we move forward with the actual building permits. Okay, good. Well, before we open it up to the public, uh, anyone on the planning board have some, any questions for the applicant? I have one question, um, Mr. Bott. I, I vaguely remember something in the application um, saying that the storage building would not be rented out. It would just be used for tenants on the property. Tenants so and the, the purpose of the of the new house is for a family member. Um, so they would have storage there. Um, Mr. Wade also owns another apartment building across the street on Monotuck Street. Um, I'm sure that they would um, take advantage of some storage space in there. You know, I, I can't say for sure what they're going to use it for, but it will not be rented out. It is so you'd, you'd be comfortable with the restriction that said it couldn't be commercially rented? Yes. I wouldn't have a problem with that at all. Um, Alan, just so you know, I mean, this is a general industrial district. It's not a residential zone. So um, I think it would make sense um, for the board to think about the ramifications of a restriction like that, given that it is still an industrial zone. Um, and there's lots of uses that are non-residential that are allowed, um, including storage. Uh, so anyway, I just wanted to right. clarify with the board that this is not a residential zone. Well, that's a good point, I think, except that it's being presented as making sense because it's residential in a largely residential neighborhood. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, it just, that's, um, that may be the case, but if the applicant came in for 1,000 square foot building that was um, for trades use or other kind of manufacturing, that could be done by right without coming to the board. So, right. 
one thing that jumped out at me in the storage space was that it was pretty close to Riverside Drive um, and there's no curb cut there at this point. So would the applicant need to come back if he was to put a driveway or something to the storage building? That would be my understanding. I mean, we went through that and um, the city does not particularly approve of two curb cuts per property. And um, which is why it was um, the, we, we don't wanna ask for a curb cut. One. I, I do understand that if we wanted one, it would have to be a whole other process. Okay. Any other questions from the board? All right, well, why don't we open it up to the public? Is there anyone here in our Zoom meeting who would like to speak regarding this application? All right. Um, I see there's a, do you see the one hand raised? Um, oh, I do, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> So Maureen, would you like to give us your name and address and? Um, te technically in a butter, uh, Maureen Scanlon, 197 Nonotuck. Uh, uh, the corner of Nonotuck and Maple. And I think I like the idea of this a lot. I think it's a really great use of that piece of land. Uh, concerned about you know, the noise for the residents next to the factory. But my only one question has to do with parking, where they're going to lose a lot of spots. They're going down to six parking spots, and there's four residential units in that building. And now they're going to have this new residence, this new house. And I don't know, is there parking on that allowed on that street? Probably so, but it's a really tight corner going from the bend of Riverside over to Maple. And I just want to make sure it's going to be safe. You know, if people can park there because they may need to. Well, we, we made the choice to reduce the number of parking spaces to the allowable level. Um, it could always be bigger. Um, there's plenty of land there for more parking spaces. And, um, you know, I my personal preference is to to cut down on parking um, when it's not needed. But, you know, if, if they wanted eight spaces, you could have eight spaces and not exceed the coverage of that lot, you would still be well under 50% coverage. So well, I just think there's that that's worth considering because there's some definitely some visibility issues in navigating those, you know, not 90 degree inter like turns. Right. Well, the, the way the the way the parking lot is laid out, you would be coming direct you would be coming out straight onto Maple Street. So you'd be making a 90 degree turn left or right. Um, you wouldn't be, you know, because the the parking lot is a about 15 feet back from the road and there's an mm -hmm. curb cut comes in before you park. So you would be turning, coming out straight. In right. The parking lot's like angled like you're describing really well. It's just going to have only six spots right. and there's four units plus this new house. Right. So I just question where the reality of there's probably going to be more residents on the property between those two buildings than those six spots permit. Thank you. That's all. That's my only yep. thought. Thank you. Always happy to have more residential units in my area. <laughs> Is there anyone else who'd like to speak regarding the proposal? <coughs> okay. All right. Um, before we close the public hearing, any other questions for the applicant by the planning board? Questions about the site? George, um, I just want to note that um, 
uh, there were some uh, questions from DPW and uh, recommendations about getting revised plans. The applicant has seen these. Um, they relate to um, um, adding scale and labels to the plan, per showing a detailed tree protection, putting in construction tracking, um, and um, creating, putting dimensions and labels on the final curb cut width. Um, and obviously there's no request to have a wider curb cut than allowed in this district. So um, that should comply with the zoning and um, a location on the plans of where all the existing and proposed utilities are gonna be located. Great. And the applicant has, has that list. So he's prepared to deal with those on his next set of plans. I do. Okay. And the other thing was that uh, prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy, the five trees that are sown on the Riverside Drive side need to be planted. Yes. There are currently some small trees on the Maple Street side. Um, and one of them is very stunted and looks to be dying right in front of the house. It might be a great gesture on the part of the applicant to uh, put another tree in there. And there's a better I, chance of survival on that corner. I think that's in the plans that that, that will happen. Any other questions from the board about the conditions or Can I just clarify, did the zoning board approval come through or are we just conditioning that, of course, our our approval, if that happens, is conditional on the zoning board's approval? The zoning board granted a permit earlier tonight. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jenna. Okay, maybe take a motion to close the public hearing. Maybe we close, close public hearing. Okay, Marissa made a motion and Alan seconded. Thank you. Any discussion? We haven't left anybody out there. All right, we'll go through our approval. Uh, all those in favor of closing the public hearing? Melissa? Yes. And David? Yep. Alan? Yes. Thank you. Jana? Yes. Sam's got his thumb up in the air. That's a yes. Okay. Marissa. Yes. And Krista. Yes. And George. Yes. Okay. Unanimous. Okay. Um, Carolyn sent us a nice memo about the conditions are pretty straightforward for the Department of Public Works. We understand about the trees that are going to be planted. Um, <laughs> Seems to be pretty straightforward, unless there are other concerns about the parking or the outbuilding. I'd be glad to hear a, a motion. Who's it going to be this time? I'll do it. Um, I move to approve a uh, site plan by Jeffrey Bott for more than 2,000 square feet construction at 3 Maple Street, Florence, map ID 23A-287 as per the conditions discussed in this meeting. Second. Thank you, Melissa. Okay, motion's made and seconded. Any discussion? Okay, we'll go through that roll again. Melissa, how yes. do you feel about, yes. And David? Yep. Alan? Yes. Sam? Okay, that's a yes. And Jana? Yes. Uh, Marissa? Yes. Great, Krista? Yes. And George? Okay, another unanimous decision with those conditions. Good luck, uh, Mr. Bott, with your project. 
Thank you very much. All right, if no one needs to take a break, we'll just move right along here. Thursday night in downtown Northampton. Well, not quite. <laughs> Someday we'll be back in downtown Northampton, right? Um, <clears throat> so let's see, it's eight o'clock. Uh, we're a little, little delayed, but we're gonna open a meeting for site plan by New Way Homes, Inc for a shared driveway at 170 Federal Street, Florence, map <clears throat> ID 23D-66 and 205. Um, we have a pretty good sized crowd of uh, neighbors, proponents or opponents of the plan. So just a reminder, we'll have a presentation by the applicant. The board will ask some clarifying questions. Then we'll open it up to the public. Um, for comments, we try to ask the public to um, certainly speak to their concerns and try not to repeat the person who spoke before you, bring new information to the floor. All right, good. So is the applicant and his or her team here? Uh, yes, by myself. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, yeah, unfortunately my engineer couldn't make it tonight. He had to uh, go someplace, so it's just me. So that's my team. <laughs> so I'm a little bit struggling. Uh, basically what it is on uh, the corner of 170 Federal Street and Warner Street, uh, gonna be putting a shared driveway in and another house behind, another house behind it uh, using a shared driveway. Uh, okay. I don't know what to tell you, George. Um, so basically, it's going to be going off of Warner Street. There'd be one driveway, which would feed the the house that was already pre-existing at 170 Federal Street, and the new construction to the as we look at it from Federal Street to the left of it. Um, and if this is approved, house number eight Warner Street will also be fed by the same driveway. Uh, my thoughts on this is, with this shared driveway, it'll be a cleaner look. You'll have less going into the driveway cuts going into the street uh, for number eight, that is. And that would take care of feeding three houses, which I think would be safer and also um, a cleaner look. Yeah. And everything, of course, will be done to DPW's regulations uh, as far as what they're looking for as far as the drainage goes and uh, the, the degree of the driveway and everything else. Um, great. You have uh, put on your your plan here that there are four. You you call them lots. Lot number one, two, three, and four. Um, lot number one and two are the new foundations that are currently in place there. Correct. Um, lot three is the existing house. And lot four is the house to be erected. Correct. Given approval of the flag plot. Okay. Correct. Um, currently, there's no access to lot number one. I just wondered if you could clarify that for me. Where is the driveway and parking for lot number one? Okay, let me see those numbers again. Uh, Over uh, here. Number one, yeah. One has a driveway going right up here to the garage and oh. up back. There's a garage right here, and the access would be here. Plan review it has nothing to do with the top. And there's enough room there, Carolyn, for a uh, driveway. But seems um, to be very. Yes, they've already gotten. I think there's there's been a curb cut permit that's been issued for that. Okay. All right. Thank you. So, so that that house is not before us tonight. Separate? No, the only Correct. thing that's in front of you is the shared driveway. The parcels are already, um, you've already approved the uh, division for these two um, lots. This lot can't be approved for division until an, uh, the shared driveway permit is granted because otherwise there's no access to this house, the new house on um, 
Federal Street. So the only permit in front of you is, is the technical review of the shared driveway. George, you used the term flag lot, I think, didn't you? No, no, I don't think it's this is a flag term. lot. No, uh, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, uh, maybe no, I missed. Um, no. Okay. And I just wanted to clarify about uh, lot number one because I didn't see a driveway and I wanted to make sure that mm -hmm. there wasn't right. a plan for it to also come off this shared driveway. Okay, and um, board members, any questions for the applicant before we open it up to the public? I, I guess I'd like to ask about the trees that I'm sure, I mean, clearly one of the, at least one of the abutters is concerned about why is it so on the on the trees there are great big white X's um, spray painted there are eight of them those are the ones I assume that will be removed uh, correct and yeah. why why are they being removed because actually the house will be 15 feet off the property line and the house will be they'll be right hanging into the roof of the house, not to mention when we dig the foundation, uh, you have to over dig by five feet. So that would go right into the root system. So even if there wouldn't be anything really left of the trees, but the thing is with the house is built, the trees would be right on top of them. What is the setback from the property line? I can't read it there. It doesn't show, I, let me show, it should be, it's supposed to be 15 feet. 15 feet from the proposed house? Yeah, from the property line on the left of you stand in Federal Street to the uh, right of the house, it'd be 15 feet. So the setback line, the, the dashed line you have drawn in, wh what is that? Okay, you talking right there? I mean, between the no, by the abutter, where the trees are. There, there's a dashed line. Go oh, up that, from that, where that, that, the dashed line shows the uh, building envelope. We're talking about right. the same thing. Right. So that would be your setback. So, Alan, That's, this is a 15 foot setback off of this line, oh. which is the required setback. The opposite side is a zero lot line, right. and it's showing seven feet to the property line. Okay, so the house itself is what, 20, 25 feet from the property line? Right now it's set at what the uh, codes are required, which is 25 feet, but it is gonna be pushed back so I wanna keep it away from the hill as much as possible. So it's gonna be put uh, in the same line as the house to the right-hand side, number 170 Federal Street to make it look proper. So I want them to at least be in line with each other. So have you had an arborist look at those trees to determine whether they would survive the construction process? Uh, no, I had an arborist go out there to measure them and to see calibrate, calibrate what size they were. Uh, but the thing is that it, the, the house is gonna end up too close to them. And while you're showing there the trunks, you have the, uh, uh, how the branches hang out and it'd be hanging right into the house itself. They're all evergreens, aren't they? Yes. So they get narrower as they get taller. No, they don't. They uh, they actually give. They're not evergreens. They're. I to be honest with you, I couldn't tell you exactly what they are. They're in the these report. are these, they're, they're, these are hemlocks. Hemlocks. Thank you. They're in the report that I supplied, um, and they they don't get narrower as you go up. They're not uh, arborvitaes. Um, I still don't, I mean, the, the trees are, are very, like, it seems like they got an attractive part of the community. So why, it's, it just seems like there needs to be some, 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 like, if, if we're, if you're adding this road and adding a bunch of houses, like, I, I don't see why, why, should allow that if you're not if you're not going to try to keep the, the trees. Yeah, but the thing is, if you try to keep them. Like I say, you, when you overdig it, it's going to get to the roots anyways. 
because you have to go five feet past when you do the foundation. Well, you don't have to build the house. Um, I wonder, Mr. Hantel, if the house could be moved a little closer towards the existing house, much mm -hmm. as your two homes in lot number one and lot number two are very close together. Well, Could you move the footprint away from these hemlocks towards the existing house? Well, I mean, we can <clears throat> we can do all that. We can do this, but whoever buys the house could want solar, and that's the southern side of the house. They could just go in there, cut them down once they move in. So we can do everything right now, and and then then as soon as I build a house, they put solar panels on. And the first thing they want is a tree to cut down. So it's it's one of those damned if you, damned if you don't kind of a things. You know, if, if I could clarify, the, so the, the uh, permit in front of the board is not about whether the house can be built. Um, it's the driveway. They are showing the landscaping and the trees that are coming down and showing replacement trees. Um, there is potential, of course, that if they kept some of those trees that they would be damaged in over two, three years, they might die. And then there's no... Um, I mean, then the next subsequent landowner would um, need to replace those trees. Um, and though you, I mean, the structure could be moved closer to 170 because that's a zero lot line anyway. So it can go all the way up to this property line right here. Um, it, there may still need to be some trees there, there may still be trees that can't survive the construction of this house. So I think if the board is concerned about having additional trees planted to replace the trees that are being taken out, that makes sense. But um, you can't deny the construction of the single family house based on the, the fact that trees are coming down. Um, because there's nothing in the zoning that says they can't remove the trees. Um, more on the tree issue, a zero lot line um, pro project does need four trees per parcel, two of which need to be along the frontage. So these plans don't show the two required trees for both these lots on the frontage. So um, they'll have to add trees in the front anyway to comply with the zero lot line requirements. Um, but you know, you could also they're they're showing he's showing four trees along this lot line. You could certainly require more trees if you felt that was appropriate. Well, I I think Carolyn, what we struggle with is this is a, a a kind of a prominent landscape because it's at the top of the hill, and these are you know uh, it's it's uh, an exemplary kind of row of trees. Um, I know hemlock aren't going to grow to be 250 years old, but they certainly are more substantive than um, smaller replacement trees that'll take 30, 40, 50 years along the road to come up to there. So um, I, I think it for some of the members of the board, it's just kind of a, a bit of a visceral reaction to see a large stand like that being taken down. And of course, the applicant's correct in saying the homeowner might come in and decide to remove those, but then again, someone may buy the house because of the stand of trees, um, because of the aesthetic that it offers. So I think that can go both ways. No, and, we- And there, there is no house yet. We should say that. So, hold I mean, on, Ms. McDermott. Sorry. Ms. McDermott, sorry. sorry, not yet. You'll get your chance. Okay. So, okay, moving away from the trees at this point, are there any other suggestions, any other clarifications for the applicant from the board members? I just wanted to clarify something that the applicant said about the position of the house. Um, I want to make sure I understood. I believe that you said that the house is actually going to move uh, in order to the proposed house is going to move to match the um, position of the house in lot three. Um, and I'm asking about that mostly because what's in, in front of us is the driveway. But if the house is moving, then that actually changes the shape of the driveway. So I just want to make sure I understand what I'm looking at. So that kind of um, matching of frontage is not what's shown here on the plan. Is that correct? Correct. It was going to be revised because it's too much concern about the hill being too steep, which it is on Federal Street. And I don't want anything to happen to it. And DPW has, uh, has voiced their concerns. 
So by pushing the house back, I think it's going to look nicer from the front and also it'll be safer from the, the steep hill that's there. Okay, thank you. The, uh, the two outbuildings on the property, mm -hmm. both have both of them have utilities coming to them, water and electricity. Um, in some places, gas too. Are there any future plans for those beyond just storage facilities? Uh, there's electricity going to the garage. I don't, there's, uh, there is, I didn't even see the water. <clears throat> and there's definitely not gas in the garage. Um, there was something in the, sh the, sh the other thing, the shed back there, which I couldn't figure out what they utilized it for. Pretty uh, sure some, huh? somebody lived there for a while. They did? I, a, I, yeah. I could, it could make sense. There's a garage door going on the gable end of it. And I don't know how they could live in there with a, it was just a paper thin garage door, but uh, so anyways, but that would be disconnected. Uh, originally I thought of raising the garage, but I think I'm gonna just, I'm gonna keep it there. And that would go with uh, lot number two. And that'd be, you know, of course, we sided, re roofed, new windows, everything else. And then I thought the shed in the back might look nice if I did the same thing to it. Just a bonus for one of the other houses. Thank you. <clears throat> Anything else, board members, or should we open a public hearing? Or oh, open it up. All right. So at this time, we'll hear from the public. And again, if you could. Um, provide new information to the board and um, ask the questions to the board and then we'll work with the applicant to clarify his uh, responses to those questions. Um, so let's see, maybe we'll, well, I guess we'll keep the plans up here, Carolyn, to make sure that if the public refers to something, we can see them. So if you'd like to George, uh, I actually prefer if we could. Uh, it's 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 difficult to to see who's speaking. Um, I mean, I'm sure it's easy enough to go back to the chair screen if people want to refer to it. Okay. You want to go to the gallery view? I, okay. If it, if other people don't mind. Sure. So then, just simply, um, the easiest way is to raise your hand. Or you can, some people are familiar with the participant feature and you can raise your hand in the participant box or you can just do this and the chair will try to call people in, in most. So now Ms. McDermott, you've been waiting. Here we go. Please Thank state you your name much. and your name and your address for the uh, minutes. Okay, can you hear me? I think I'm on. Um, so Mary McDermott, and I own the property directly across from 170 Federal Street, the property at 171 Federal Street. And you know, I have observed the construction, well, the the um, well, what's been going on with the foundations on uh, Warner. But I'm I'm very concerned. It's hard to separate out the driveway from the house because I imagine you can't really have that house without a driveway going back there. Um, and my big concern is living across from that hill is how unstable it's been. It has collapsed in the past. So I don't see how it's going to sustain all the building that's going on and having a house go right next to 170 and have the trees taken down. So that's, that's my worry about the construction that's happening. It's, it's collapsed. Can you tell me about this? <laughs> well, I don't remember exactly when it was. I know the Joneses complained to the city. They wanted the city to do something about it. I don't know if there's any record of that. It had to have been, uh, you know, I honestly don't know when, 2011. Um, and I don't know who ended up repairing it, but it was a big mess, uh, as you can imagine. So, and if you've seen the property, it sounds like uh, some of you have. It's an extremely steep hill that goes directly up. And, um, you know, there's always been issues, there's been rain with, with that hill. And now I just think with the added properties being put on that property, there's, there's a, plenty to be concerned about. And I don't have any technical words for it. That's all I can say is I'm worried. I don't see how it can be held up. Hey, thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, phone number, no? Who else would like to come to the 
podium. Mr. Uh, Kajka. Jared. Hi, I'm Jared Kajka. I live at 40 Nutting Ave. Um, my concerns are, are very similar to Mary's. I live two houses down from um, Federal Street, so I, I see the construction. The the wall or the the hill slipped in uh, 2017. It was midsummer, and then they cleaned it up uh, months later because I know it had snowed, and they had to come through with the loader and repair the the wall or the the hill. Uh, my other concern is just with the added runoff even though they did the Hinkley Street project to divert the water, the added water shed still um, in front of my house, it still backs up quite often up the um, um, drains. So, you know, given that the added three houses plus the added footprint from the, the driveway, um, still seems like there's a, a drainage issue there not to mention the, the runoff of that hill, taking the trees out with the root systems and all of that. Thank you. Can I ask a question, sir? When, for both of you talked about the hill collapsing, did, the, did, the, um, did that impact the, the road or the other neighbors or was it just a mess to be cleaned up on it, that property? It slid into the road about two to three feet. They came through and pushed it back and then dealt with it later, but it was a pretty substantial amount of um, gravel that, that or land, uh, I guess it was, it was mostly the grass and what was under it, um, but it was nothing that was addressed. It just stayed there for quite a while, but it, it you know, it narrowed it two, two to three feet until they pushed it back over. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Barnes. Uh, good evening. I'm Benjamin Barnes. I live at uh, one, one 117 Riverside Drive. And uh, if you look at the site plan, uh, my lot is on the south edge to the south of the property that we're talking about. It's the left and it has across the top of it trees to remain. Um, I'm here really to speak on behalf of uh, seven trees. The uh, they are tall uh, sp specimen hemlocks and two, they're not beech trees, they're ash trees that are about five feet north of the property line that runs between my house and Federal Street. Uh, I have spoken to Mr. Hansel about the project. We had a good conversation and I wanna say at the outset, I'm broadly supportive of the URB plan to permit infill residential construction. I knew that when I moved here some years ago, I know some of my neighbors are not as comfortable with it as I am. What I am concerned about is that the, the standard trees we're discussing is an aesthetic and uh, important uh, marker in the, in the, it's prominent in the neighborhood. It also serves as a visual buffer between the properties and the hemlocks are very healthy. Um, I do notice with respect to uh, a solution uh, is not to cut them down, it seems to me at this point, but is to ask the developer to consider putting the, what he's knowing showing as a proposed house on lot four to right up against the zero lot line. And then the driveway could be shorter. Uh, there'll be less paving involved. And um, he, he said he's gonna move it back away from Federal Street anyway. So it, you have about seven feet, but that between the Northeast corner of the proposed house and the zero lot line. But if you go to the west, you see how that space opens up. You could actually twist the house slightly and put it right on the zero lot line, which is something that we, we give developers the opportunity to uh, further develop property by allowing that zero lot line. But we protect the abutters by saying that the zero lot line can only come when the developer owns the property on both sides of the zero lot line. And I think that if the developer were to do this, uh, he would see that the proposed house would actually have a large open space on its south to its southwest, where near where the shed is. Between the lot line, that's the party line between the proposed house and my property, my two neighbor's properties, there's quite a long space before you get to my house. I take 50 or 60 feet. And so if you move the house, proposed house to the north, 
save the existing trees. The person who's back there is not only going to have their own yard, but they're going to be looking across 50 or 60 feet of mine, and uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it becomes a larger open space. So I think that the plan would be improved uh, with a shorter shared driveway and the house moved to right up against the zero lot line, leaving more space uh, between the proposed house and the uh, northern uh, mm -hmm. rear lines of the myself and my and the two butters, other two abutters. Um, with respect to the the hillside, it it I would say it slumped and came out into the street. And to my knowledge, other than putting the dirt back off the street, there was never any repair. I used to talk to Cindy Jones about it, and she said she wasn't able to get anything to happen. The uh, grass and wildflowers kind of filled in, and it. I was surprised how the hill healed itself over the last couple of years, but it definitely was, it gets very saturated. I don't know how that, how that uh, relates to the proposed construction, but that's what happened at the time. So I just asked Mr. Anzell to think carefully about the siting of the proposed house and where the idea of the trees could be saved. I think they would be an asset to somebody moving into in the neighborhood just as much as they would be a liability. And I think moving the house to the north would get them out of the way of out of the way of the trees, or there could be some minimum trimming of the hemlocks, and it would be fine. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Sure. Barnes. <clears throat> Mr. Weiss. Yeah, I don't have a lot to add to what uh, Benjamin could you Barnes. Just get, could you just give us your address, please? Yeah, for the my address is my name is Ben Weiss. My address is one eleven Riverside. Uh, it's the middle property on the south uh, end of the plot plan. It says, it says Andrew White, the previous owner in the, uh, in the plan. <clears throat> and so I don't have a lot new to say other than that I think our property is going to be one of the ones that will be most dramatically impacted by the loss of the trees that you guys have been talking about. And it is, I don't want to overstate it, but it's pretty dramatic. In our backyard right now, I sent pictures to Carolyn, but we look up at the trees. We're kind of set down in a hill. And so instead of looking up at the trees, if the project goes through, the trees will be gone. We'll just be looking up at a house. And so I just wish that there was a way to do the project and maintain the trees there because it's such a it's going to be such a dramatic change. Um, and so I also had a good talk with Mr. Hansel. He was very cordial, uh, but explained that he couldn't do anything about the trees. Uh, I had asked if you know the trees do come down, if it could be um, like a pretty serious effort at replacing them and not just a couple of small trees because they're so huge. And Mr. Hansel wasn't able to kind of commit to anything. I know that if there aren't any subst substantial trees that come in, we'll wind up putting up our own trees because it's such a loss of both of nature and of a privacy barrier. So I'm not one to kind of jump on these calls um, the first time I've done it, but it's just, it's a pretty dramatic thing for our, our yard, and so I wanted to speak up about it. Thank you, Mr. Weiss. <clears throat> Someone else? Uh, hello, Deborah. Hi, my name is Deborah Berkovitz. I live at 41 Warner Street. Um, I do actually think that Mr. Hensel has a choice, which is that he doesn't need to build an additional three properties on this lot. And I think his saying that he wants to move the house back to make it look proper is very ironic for somebody who is building the same house everywhere with no regard for the historic nature of the neighborhood. But I wanna to speak to a couple things specifically. Um, one is that I have video of Warner Street on multiple days as a river. And this starts at Hinkley and we actually sail paper boats uh, and and wood boats down Warner Street. And the loss of that much of uh, permeable surface to me is really concerning. There's a lot of open land there that is now going to be building uh, paved driveway and roofs. And um, we have tremendous drainage issues. We have huge drainage issues there all the way down the netting. I have concerns about uh, both in the um, during construction as well as after construction. Uh, Warner Street is not a full width street given uh, it was built as Stump Street in, uh, in the 1840s, the houses built on that street. 
and uh, it's already really not feasible to park on either side of the street. So during the construction phase, uh, the, and I also would love to know what the hours of construction is because there are people on that job site, I think, before they're supposed to be. Um, but uh, in terms of the construction vehicles there to build three houses, it's absolutely causing a problem for residents of the street. And then also for cars who are gonna be uh, coming to visit the houses that are gonna be owned by the houses, whatever, it's just that street can't tolerate a lot more. So I have a lot of other choice words I'd like to share with the developer, but I won't say them now, those are my concerns. And I'd be happy to share a video of, of the drainage issues on Warner and on Nutting. Thank you. Carolyn, uh, a question for you. Um, the, the DPW does not allow surface drainage from the site down the driveway into the public street. Is, is that correct? So for, for driveways at this slope, um, they require, they're requiring uh, drainage to be maintained on site. And so that's why the plans show um, a swale and an infiltration area at the base of the driveway on the private property. Um, and that's been reviewed by DPW, but yes, that's to capture the runoff from the driveway and not allow it to just flow, sheet flow into the street. Um, also just um, the DPW did make comments that you all saw uh, relative to um, um, any damage that might happen to that slope on the Federal Street side. So um, the applicant would have to um, repair any kind of damage that would, um, that, that would happen um, if the side slope gave way or if there was any kind of um, issue there. Is that just during construction? Well, it certainly would be during construction. The end homeowner who purchased the property would be responsible for, you know, their the private property. Um, if something, um, I, you know, I don't know how the maintenance works. If some, if part of the hill slipped into Federal Street, you know, let's say five years down the road, um, I. I'm not sure how DPW would handle that sort of um, kind of uh, maintenance. So back to the drainage issue through down the driveways. So does that mean there would not be any increase of water draining off the site from the huge increase in impervious cover? So right now there's an existing driveway. This shared driveway is proposed to essentially use the, um, the footprint of the existing driveway, but widen it in certain locations to accommodate the shared piece of it. It's actually, um, I would suggest would be an improvement over existing conditions because now along with this um, expansion of the existing footprint of the driveway, there'll be a system to capture and, and infiltrate all the runoff that currently is running into Warner Street now. Mm. So the, the gravel driveway that's there now, that's being constructed, is just replacing an older asphalt, narrower driveway. Um, there, the shared driveway, I don't believe there's any work being done on the shared driveway now. I think it's part of construction of one of the other lots. Um, well, there's, there's a gravel driveway. I mean, I drove up it. Um, oh, up the hill? The, from Warner Street. Yeah, okay. I mean, if it's, I hadn't, I haven't seen it in the last couple of weeks, so I wasn't, I, was not aware of the condition. The same driveway that was yeah. the same driveway that was there, just that the, you know the truck's been going up there. So and actually there won't be more blacktop. By having the three houses off one driveway, you're actually saving on blacktop, which will reduce the amount of it there. But that's where the previous paved driveway was, right? Yeah, it still is there. Right. Oh well, all right. I think Alan, if I might. The, the applicant will be 
installing these large in-ground infiltration chambers somewhere along that line that they're that are specced on the you know that which are very popular nowadays um plastic chambers for stormwater management so that will hopefully um serve as kind of a large infiltration system for the water coming down off the driveway and off the lots there and which lot is going to be responsible for maintaining it oh it's uh, it's going to be that's going to be written up, of course, by like the with the, the attorney will draw that up. So the three houses will be responsible for maintaining that. So it's like a condo type situation. No, no. So the zoning requires that when uh, as part of the shared driveway, the easements for the maintenance responsibilities be uh, distributed across the users of the driveway. <clears throat> so it's it's um, not really. Um, it's, it's it's basically an easement that's assigned to each of those lot owners. It's not um, a creation of a condominium. Hey, Sam. <laughs> Sam, can you adjust your camera so we can see more than just like the top of your shiny head? <laughs> I, I mean, not to push back, but that just seems like a recipe for disaster. I mean, the notion of, I think it's just, I'm, maybe, maybe this, this is beyond this project, but that just seems like a recipe for disaster. I don't understand how you could have, you know, just, it's, it sounds it sounds like that's an easement for four people for four different properties ignoring a, pro a problem. Well, then the DPW, they have to file a maintenance plan with the city and the DPW. All four of them do? Um, once the DPW, well, it's in there. Or they do it a quarter each. So the driveway is going to be shared with three lots. It's not four. Um, and as um, stipulated in the zoning and as across other shared driveways throughout the city, there's maintenance and responsibilities distributed across the three users of the driveway. So um, that is the way that um, that's stipulated in the code. And uh, that's the way it's been on record for other properties as well. Um, and so buying into it, you know that, okay, you share your driveway with two other people and you, you um, have to um, abide by those um, records, those uh, easements that are on record. Can you clarify if the shared driveway, if, not, if denying it uh, results in one house not being able to be built? because there's no access. So this shared driveway also allows the developer to build an additional house on the lot and without permission for the shared driveway, he would not be able to do that. Um, there's no other access for the property except off of Warner because it's too steep to come off of Federal. Um, the board can only deny a, sh a permit for a shared driveway at site plan approval. They can deny it if it doesn't meet the technical requirements in the zoning for a shared driveway, not because they're trying to limit the total amount of development on a property. Any other comments from the non-board members? And Ms. McDermott, before we go to you, let's just make sure there are some others in the crowd who may want to speak. We'll, we will come back to you though. I can't see if you're raising your hand, everyone. If not, okay, we'll go back to Ms. McDermott. Please call me Mary. But my question is, isn't the plan for the shared driveway, so it's over the existing driveway, you're going to account for drainage but aren't you extending it to the back of the new proposed house? Isn't this driveway being lengthened, the present driveway? That's a question for the developer. Yes, it is. It'll be, it'll be a little bit longer and to uh, go to the house up to next to uh, Federal Street. So the current garages there are coming down, is that it? No, they're gonna stay. For the lots or whatever you're doing. Okay, well, Again, I just feel concerned about the hill. I know Mr. Barnes didn't think it was a big deal when that 
eroded, but for those of us living downstream, as they say, it was more concerning. And I have to say, I don't believe that 2017 was the only time that it occurred because I wasn't living there then. I mean, I've owned the property since 2006, but I wasn't living. And when I was living there, there was another occasion when there was a problem with the hill coming down, maybe less of a problem, but it did occur. Thank you. Um, Candy Gibbs, your hand is raised. Hi, Candy Gibbs, 147 Hinkley Street. Um, is this property connected or to be connected to the 61 Warner Street that the developer has bought and has a demolition um, permit on? Is those two properties going to end up being connected in another property built or another access built? Sorry, I'm kind of late to the conversation. I actually haven't seen the plan for this current project. Okay, what, what, which one are you talking about now? The, the... Well, didn't you buy 61 Warner Street and you're, demol and you're doing a demolition there on that property? Yes, I is did. That, yeah, and is that property going to connect to this property? I... Sorry, sorry, that has that's not at issue tonight. We're not talking about sixty one Warner Street tonight. Okay, someone brought up Warner Street. M M Carolyn Mish brought it up, saying the only other way to access the property would be from Warner Street, and because there's already three property, there are already three properties proposed for this one. That, right, that's true. We're not talking about sixty one Warner, Warner Street tonight. This property is on the corner of Warner and Federal. So the access is from Warner. Okay, so that's not near or adjacent to 61. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I yep. don't have a map in front of me. Thank you. Anyone else? Hands raised, hands waving. Okay, all right. Well, hearing no other questions from the public, we'll uh, keep it open for a little bit. We'll move back to the board. Other questions from the board members for the applicant? Um, yeah, I have a question for Mr. Hansel. What, have you considered the possibility of moving the, what is it, I forget, lot four, is that the one, closer to the trees, that one, to move it as Mr. Barnes suggested further uh, north to get away from the trees to so allow them to remain? I can, I like the way the, the design came out. So that's why I was saying that route. I, I'm sorry, say that again? I like the way the plan came out. So that's why I was keeping it the way it was. So say, the, say, say we asked you, say we approved it if you have your current plan, but you moved it to the lot line, would you still build the house? I think I really, because I still, you know, have this that somebody could still go on there and still cut everything right down right after. No, I no, no, no. Take the trees out of it for a second. Yep, if yep. we said that you have to build the house up against the lot line, don't worry about the trees. Would you still build the house? Why would you do that though? So, well, say the planning board gave you a permit to build the house up against the lot line. Would you still do it? I don't. I don't think that'd be fair for the planning board to ask that. <laughs> I mean, Carolyn, I would like to go back to your earlier statement about the approval of the shared driveway. Yeah. And even though it's a site plan approval, which opens us up to my understanding to pretty much everything that is put on the plan, um, you're saying that we don't really have any purview around the siting of the house. Um, I, I was suggesting, I mean, you can't say the house can't be built there in order to save the trees. I think if you can say, you can, um, I think you need more information about whether the trees, saving the trees, um, is possible even with moving the house. Um, and you could certainly, um, you could certainly say that the trees have to be protected. Um, that's not the same thing as guaranteeing that the trees would be saved, I guess is what I'm saying. And you can't, um, 
deny the site plan for the driveway is a backdoor means essentially to deny construction of the house. Um, the, tr the driveway, you're reviewing the driveway and the site plan and on the merits and the technical merits of the design of the driveway and the site layout. It may be that the applicant needs to relocate the structure in order to um, meet site plan criteria and that's okay. Um, but it's just, um, uh, um, there has to be uh, a reason for that. You can't just say you can't build the house. Okay, thank you. Planning board members. I want to go back to this. So we, we can't say <clears throat> we, we can't, we want to protect the trees. So we want, but we want to allow his right to build. And we have to allow his right to build. We, we have to allow, allow his right to build. Um, I guess I, I'm, I don't, I guess I'm leaning towards and, I, and and you can just tell me if this is not allowed, but you know, if someone else wants to cut down the trees, let them cut down the trees. I don't understand why, I don't, I don't understand why this is, he's right that if someone, when someone wants to buy it, they can cut down the trees, but I don't see why we're just jumping, jumping over that. I, I mean, the whole reason why people are moving and spending absurd sums of money on properties in Northampton is because they're beautiful tree line properties. It's not because there's solar, solar power. And the new and I just don't and I feel like that's that is worth protecting uh, because I think it's protecting people's people's property. Um, you might if you're um, if your interest as a board is to require tree protection, um, I think you will need more information um, from the applicant from a uh, certified arborist to determine what um, would be the necessary steps to take in order to protect the trees from the construction. So if that's the way you're leaning, I would strongly recommend that you continue the hearing so that the applicant can have um, a recommendation from a certified arborist about the um, steps that would be required to um, protect those trees. So if it's spacing, um, that's one thing, but there may also uh, be necessary um, root protection depending on the species and the size of the tree, and also an evaluation about the health of the trees can that you'd want to take into consideration before just blanketly requiring um, the structure to be relocated or um, moved over, which I think may be a good idea, except even with moving the structure, there still might be root damage that eventually kills the tree. So you'd want to know that first before you went through all of that process. I, 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 guess, I guess I'm tr I'm trying to not do that, but I feel like I'm being put I'm being put in a position by the developer where they're saying, I mean, if if something happens during construction, if something happens during construction. I'm not I'm not you know demanding uh, you know I, I don't I. I feel like it, it would be, it's not what I would like to do to, to demand, uh, you know, putting up I, huge barriers, but, I, but, but if, if, if I'm being put in a position where that's the only option, well, then I guess that that's the only option. I, I, I'm in favor of continuing to get this plan. I mean, this, this, this site plan in this, in this uh, proposal is, one of the lesser developed ones I have seen in my time on the board there, you know, the DPW's, you know, notes number of deficiencies in the, in the plan. There's not, you know, we're hearing about issues with grading and we're not seeing, you know, grading on the, on the plans. 
so I, and I and I appreciate that. This is, you know, difficult. To, it, it costs it costs money, but we we have a butters here that are concerned about this. And I don't want to ask him to change the plan. Uh, you know, Mr. Mr. Hansel, I don't want to ask you to change the plan if uh, an arborist says change it or don't. It's not going to matter. These trees aren't going to make it anyway. But um, but if we're hearing, you know, if we're hearing about or say that 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 you know it could it make you know that's important to them, I want to I want to at least consider that within the context of an of of a of an, an arborist saying whether or not a change a change in the plans could make a difference um so i i don't think i mean i i personally think that this plan could have been better presented in the outset and so the question of continuing it and asking for more information is consistent with what we see with other proposals and i don't think it's too much to ask thank you marissa and I, I i think i would add to that too i i appreciate your remark about the uh the plans as they were presented. Um, they are difficult because they're all squished into this eight and a, uh, 11 and a half by 14 sheet of paper, perhaps not even that big. So I would ask the, uh, the, the applicant to come back with a separate kind of drawing of the site plan itself and have that separated from the planting plan and separating from the storm water all of that is just too, too small for uh, me to work with. So I would add that to also having the arborist spend some work, some time with you. I'd like to also just add, if, if there's gonna be a conversation with an arborist, we've already heard that the, the distance of the house from Federal Street is gonna change per DPW comments. Um, and I guess, uh, Given what you said, it doesn't sound like you uh, have any urgency to move the house north. Uh, but you know, considering, I think it would be good to have a conversation with the arborist as to what the scenario would be in terms of the tree health if you did move it north. So we understand if there's any point in even going down that road at all. And then the other thing I would do, I mean, I understand it's a lot easier to take out these big trees when there's no house there than if there is a house. And the last thing I would wanna do is buy a house whose roots had been damaged <clears throat> You know, we're, we're mature trees and the roots have been damaged on my side. Those trees are going to fall onto my brand new house that I just bought. So you don't want an unsafe condition, but maybe there is a medium ground where not every tree has to go or something. You know, maybe there's somewhere to to find where some of the trees are more problematic than others. So, and uh, I think uh, the continuation will help you come to that point. Um, the other thing I would like to see is, is there anything that we can, I don't know if this is possible, but can we get any kind of stabilization of that slope um, while you're digging. Um, you know, I don't know what that, there's a lot of ways you could do that. Um, but um, but is, that, is that something that we can ask for, Carolyn? Um, you want, it, so uh, uh, almost an engineering assessment of the, um, of the slopes. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what I'm asking for. I guess is my <laughs> question. I don't want to make yeah. it too arduous, but I mean, if it is something that is going to be an issue for the future homeowner um, as well as the neighbors, you know, it seems like something. You know, when you have an excavator out there digging a foundation, is the time to deal with it. Um, it strikes me that I, I'm not sure that that's our concern. It, it should be of great concern to the applicant, to the developer. Yeah. But given that worst case, it apparently slumped a couple of feet into the street, uh, you know, they, they're required to maintain their own property and they own their own hill. I don't know that, <clears throat> that the planning board needs to impose requirements that they do that. But going on to what, what has been discussed, I also am in favor of continuing it. I just want to make clear to the applicant that the, the uh, arborist Will should hopefully give us information about different scenarios, uh, how, whether the root, the trees could be protected um, if the house is built where it's presently proposed, and whether it would improve their longevity to move it further to a zero lot line. So I'd be in favor of getting that information. So your next scheduled meeting is December tenth. And um, you have a couple of things already. I don't know if a month is enough time for the applicant, but I would suggest maybe you schedule this for um, 
8 or 8.30 on the 10th or potentially move it to January? Well, Mr. Hensel, how quickly could you get an arborist out there? I could get an arborist out there rather quickly. That's my would belief. Rather, would you rather December or January? I think, I think December would be fine. And should something happen in the meantime? And we're also asking you to make some of the revisions to the plans. Yeah, the so show. So, us some revised plans for that meeting. Yeah, like you said, you want to see a separate just for that lot itself and everything else. And, yep. Yeah, and some of the things that the DPW indicated to would be helpful. Well, they, I think it was on the on what they gave to you already, if you read that. Um, I believe it was. I don't know. I thought it was. But the thing well, is, it is, but it's not. I mean, it's not a visual. I mean, we're not all engineers and DPW workers, and you know, like I'm a, I'm a yeah. lawyer, right? You know, like I, I, it, I mean, in order to do this, it, it, we, you know, we need, we need more. Well, um, yeah, it was we, just kind of, it was kind of also common sense on my part that common sense on my part, you need to push it back further because if you see something that could be a potential problem, you want to stay away from it, and so by pushing it back, it just, uh, it made more sense keeping it away from anything that would go near the hill. Okay. Sure, we're, we're just asking, I mean, that as long as you're coming back, it yep. would be great to be able to see it. Uh, for right. those of us who are less visually inclined. Okay, no more problem. <laughs> so I, I would recommend you putting um, it a little bit later, maybe 8.30, because if you have you do have other items that are have already come. Um, and one of them including a discussion again about the public forum that we were supposed to start an hour ago. <laughs> so that's gonna be up on, um, front of this, um, if you continue to December 10th, that's what I would recommend. Okay, let's do it. I so, would move to continue this to December 10th so the applicant can make the um, revisions to his proposal as suggested, and in, in particular, report an arborist. And so to continue that to December 10th at what, 8.30, Carolyn? I would say at least, yeah. yeah. Okay, 8.30. Is, is there second. a second? Second. I second it. We all so second just it. For the, <laughs> just for the public to know, then the public hearing is still open. You're welcome to attend the meeting on the 10th to listen to the uh, presentation and provide comments. Um, okay, the motions, any, any more discussion on the motion? All right, let's have a quick vote. Sam Taylor, how do you feel? Okay, Marissa. Yes. Melissa. Yes. And David. Yep. Alan. Yep. Okay, Jana. Yes. Krista. Yes. Okay, so it's unanimous. We'll be moving for, um, this meeting the, till December 10th at 830. Thank you very much, Mr. Cancel, are you still here? Yes, I am. And next time, right. I, next time I'll come better prepared with somebody else that can talk better than I can. Well, you did okay for a rookie. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Everybody's a critic. We're sorry. Yeah. <laughs> All right, folks. So we're the planning board's going to move on to some other business. You're welcome to stay, of course, if you'd like. Um, but we have some other items on the agenda that we're going to take up. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Mm -hmm. We're going to discuss our form-based code, form code for the downtown. I see Mr. Flinker here, consultant. Carolyn, do you want to give us a little background first? Sure. Um, so um, I just want to give um, a quick... Um, Introduction. So this is a the public forum scheduled to look at the zoning, sort of the private side of development in central business, um, in the central business district. Um, currently, um, the uh, we've talked a lot about. Um, this goes back um, 20 years now. We've talked about design issues and. Um, related development scenarios as, as it relates to downtown. We have a central business architecture committee. Um, some members who I think are um, here in attendance tonight um, that has 
had the jurisdiction of reviewing design issues as it relates to the private side of development, so the buildings, how the buildings look, what kind of um, details are required. Um, and as the Central Business District has expanded, there's been um, um, different um, characteristics in different blocks of the building that have been brought under the jurisdiction of design review. And, um, you know, as the, at the planning board level, we've talked about um, uh, different jurisdictions between what planning board reviews and what Central Business Architecture reviews. Uh, and so all of this to say that we've been working on um, trying to um, create um, a more flexible development review process uh, to acknowledge the fact that there are these differences and different characteristics in different parts of the downtown. Um, we also know that there's been changing demands in the types of uses. So currently we only, we do not allow uh, residential use um, on the street front in the central business district. And at the same time, we know there's been increasing demand for residential uses and multifamily uses, um, mostly in the areas surrounding the main street. So um, the idea about reevaluating our zoning has, um, um, incorporated uh, concepts of how do we adjust um, to this new economy or changing economy? Um, how do we create better and more flexible opportunities, provide relief, make it easier for permitting? Um, and um, what kind of standards we want to see maintained or expanded um, in terms of design review and then also establishing some consistency. So, um, people, anyone knows exactly sort of what's gonna be expected both on the private side, but also the development between the buildings and the back of the curb. And, and so when street um, sidewalks are torn up, how, what's the expectation of um, rebuilding those um, sidewalks in front of the building? So we've had a couple of projects recently, um, including um, the lumber yard redevelopment that um, required um, a whole reconstruction of the sidewalk in the public space in front of that building, but we don't really have basic standards for how you do that and what kind of um, elements are required. So this um, is really sort of a, it's, it's not, it's a very different evaluation than the evaluation we're conducting now for the um, street redesigning Main Street itself, which is just about the, it's just about the street, um, Part and not so much about what happens on the private side. Um, so, we, so I'm going to turn it over to the consultants who have helped, been helping us develop this different kind of code for downtown um, to bring you all up to speed on sort of where we've gone. And um, but I just wanted to make sure that it was clear that you know this is not um, uh, another forum that we had on Tuesday was about redesigning Main Street. This is not about Main Street. So Dylan, I'll hand it over to you to start off. Um, and just make sure you're not muted there. Good evening, everybody. Um, thanks for sticking around members of the public who came to see this and thanks for having us members of the planning board. Um, so I'm Dylan Sussman, I'm from Dodson and Funker. Um, I have interacted with some of you before, but I think not all of you. Um, so Dodson and Flinker is a planning firm located in Florence. We do this kind of work across the Northeast. So we're very excited to be working in our own hometown. Um, and the project has been an ongoing looking at um, zoning for downtown Northampton. Um, for several years now, and what we're going to do tonight is go through some of the sort of planning side of the zoning, right? So getting clear about why we would change zoning and what direction we would change it in, and introduce some of the key concepts um, for the zoning. And then in a subsequent forum, we'll get into some of the details more. So I'm going to share a presentation with you. Um, and then we'll have some time for discussion after that. So, sharing the screen. All 
All right, here we are. It's November 12th, talking about downtown. And again, we're talking about zoning. We're not talking about um, the design of Main Street, the street itself. Okay, so there are gonna be some questions for you at the end of this. Um, does the underlying rationale for the zoning change make sense to you? Do the proposed district and sub-district changes make sense to you? Do the zoning recommendations and intent statements capture the vision? And what are your hopes and fears about zoning changes? So you can think about those when we're going through this, right? So the project area is downtown. Um, that's Main Street in the middle of the image running sort of northeast to southwest and then King Street running down to Pleasant Street running north-south. Um, we've had a, a public input on this. That's you know a fair amount of public input. We've had focus groups with the chamber and with the Downtown Northampton Association. We had a public forum way back in October, 2018. Um, I've met with the planning board before on this and the Central Business Architecture Committee and we've done some stakeholder interviews. And I'm gonna tell you about what we learned through that public input. Um, so here's what we learned. Uh, the downtown core, which is you know basically Main Street and streets immediately adjacent to that is broadly loved by the people of Northampton. They love the wide sidewalks. They love the historic architecture. People are really excited about Blasky Park. Um, they do have some concerns though. Traffic safety, especially bike safety was brought up. Um, no surprise, signs of social distress like homelessness and panhandling. Um, as a concern, empty storefronts and closing businesses, which is only accelerated with the pandemic. Um, a lack of maintenance of public infrastructure, housing affordability, how to maintain vibrant retail as it shrinks. Um, so some design directions for, for zoning are coming out of that are to improve the public realm, right? So the walkability of Main Street is its sort of key competitive edge. Um, and it really propelled Main Street to become what it was when it was the only place that had a walkable Main Street in the region. Um, and it now has more competition and so um, we need to make sure that we pay more attention to the public realm, the area between the front of the building and the curb to make sure that that walkability continues and advances. Um, maintaining the integrity of the historic architecture is, is important and doing that through the zoning. Balancing historic preservation with other goals that Northampton has like affordable housing and um, energy efficient buildings and reducing climate change is important. Allowing flexibility to respond to a changing economy is something that would be valuable. Um, and then making the central business architecture committee process more predictable. Um, so currently the, the CBAC committee has some rules of thumb that it uses. So we wanna make those explicit. We wanna make the standards more objective and we wanna align the zoning with, with the central business architecture standards. Okay, so then the next area we're looking at is the side street areas. The side streets are like, you know, Masonic Street, Center Street, um, Gothic Street, Armory. Um, so they're not the, his, the, the core of Main Street, which has a very particular character with, you know, three-story, four-story brick buildings with shop fronts. Um, side Street's a different thing from, from Main Street. So um, this area has more opportunities for redevelopment. Um, it has a more mixed character. It has lower traffic volumes, which in some ways makes it more comfortable to walk. On the other hand, the sidewalks are narrow and there are limited bike facilities. Um, there's concern that the zoning might be preventing new development um, and concern about the relationship between this area and then the adjacent residential areas, um, from primarily about parking space. So design directions for this area, for the zoning, are to establish a vision for the public realm. So what do we want the area between the front of the buildings and the edge of the curb to be like? Um, should it be like Main Street where you have buildings right up to the edge of the sidewalk? Um, or should it be different? Um, in the images you see here, you can see that it, some of the areas in this, in this uh, part of town currently have a different character, right? There's a small front, very small front setback with landscaping. Um, so other design directions allowing more flexibility of building types and architectural design than on Main Street, but 
while still ensuring high quality architecture that reinforces the street edge and shapes public space. Um, so um, this, when we're talking about four maze zoning, we're thinking about buildings as the shaper of, um, of our public space. And our, our main public space is our, our streets and our sidewalks. Um, so we wanna make sure that the interface between the private development and the public right of way is shaping that public space and making it an appealing place, which is a key aspect of walkability. It's also a key aspect of economic competitiveness um, is it makes an attractive, appealing place. Okay, moving on. Um, another design direction is encouraging building types that support mixed use and active street life um, without requiring commercial frontages. And I'll get into that more later. Um, and then streamlining, streamlining architectural review and establishing a new zoning district that's tailored to this area. So then Lower Pleasant Street Ponds um, and Lower King Street is the, the final ring of downtown, right? We start in the middle on Main Street, we move out to the side streets, and then we move out to those edges on Lower Pleasant and Ponds and Lower King Street. So this area has the most potential for redevelopment because it has big lots that are underutilized. There are some buildings that are re reaching the end of their functional lifespan. It has high traffic volumes, um, which means that some kinds of uses are gonna want to locate there um, because there's traffic and there's visibility to cars passing by. Uh, there's proximity to the downtown and bike paths and street improvements that are underway or planned. Concerns include um, the inconsistency of the building design and that the site design is sometimes or often not really pedestrian friend friendly, when, you know, especially when you have a parking lot coming right up to the edge of a, of a sidewalk um, and frequent curb cuts. So design directions for this area establish a clear design for the public realm. And what do we want the public realm to be like here? Um, and then make sure that the zoning is reinforcing what we want. Um, allow more flexibility in the design of buildings than on Main Street, while ensuring again that there's sort of basic design standards that are in place, um, which currently there are not for buildings in this area, um, except through site plan review. Um, allow more contemporary architecture in this area. Focus on housing development um, so that there are more residents to support the downtown businesses. And so that we're um, having housing that meets the needs of Northampton's diverse residents. And um, finally, addressing green spaces and planning for a redevelopment at a larger scale and establishing a zoning district that's tailored to this area. So those are the sort of the planning impetus of the zoning, right? Um, so three key points. Current zoning in the CBD treats the entire central business district in the same way when the area is actually quite diverse. Um, the central business architecture committee guide uh, standards ref reflect that diversity, um, but the zoning could do more to reflect the diversity. Zoning for Pleasant Street and, and King Street, the Lower Pleasant Lower King, could do more to facilitate appropriate development. That's particularly true for the general business districts and pleasant and cons. And finally, the zoning could be more flexible to respond to current and future demands while still promoting the things that um, Northampton values like walkability, diversity, and economic resilience. So moving into the zoning, from the planning to the zoning. So this is the, the project area. You can see that central business in the middle is the largest zone in the area. Um, then you've got general business at the south. Um, there are a couple of pockets of office industrial zoning um, at the southern middle end of the southern end of central business, entranceway business in the north. And then there are a couple areas of URC um, that the proposal is to fold into these new districts. Those are predominantly currently um, parks and open space areas. So this is the proposed zoning map um, for beginning discussion and conversation. Um, so the central business district boundaries largely remain the same. 
Um, the central, there's a new district, two new subdistricts carved out of that. The first is called the core district and that's along Main Street, running basically from about Holly Street to about South Street, and then going up Pleasant Street to the end of the Hotel Northampton and down, uh, sorry, up King Street to Hotel Northampton and down Pleasant Street to the rail trail. And then the remainder of Central Business District is in what's called the Central Business Side Street District or sub-district. And then um, the various districts, the entra entra entranceway business districts and general business district and OI um, become central business gateway district, which is a new district or sub-district. So what is a central business core district? Um, the idea here is that we're gonna maintain <laughs> enhance the district as sort of the premier center for walkable mixed use commercial in Northampton in the region. So we're going to build on its strength. We're going to focus on strengths. And the way to do that is to really focus on pedestrian safety, comfort, and attractiveness, public realm, the word I keep using. We're going to maintain the historic integrity of the architecture, which is a draw for the area, and provide predictable and efficient permit review. Um, the side street, the remainder of what um, is currently called the central business district. The intent here is to support continued development. So whereas down on the core, we're, we're looking to kind of maintain what's there and not expecting much change. Um, on the side street, we're looking for a little more continued development. Um, and the idea is that this district supports the core district um, with complementary uses that are within walking distance. And it also trans creates a transition between central business core and the residential areas. This is what it's doing already, right? Um, so we want to build on that. And again, the standards focus on walkability, um, sensitive integration of new development with historic district, uh, historic architecture, right? So um, a little less focused on preservation here, but still wanting to make sure that things are compatible. Um, and again, ensuring predictable and efficient permit review. The gateway, um, the idea is to create a, an attractive gateway so that when you reach the roundabout, as development and redevelopment happens, that development signals to you that you're entering downtown Northampton. Um, and when you enter King Street from the north, when you get to about stop and shop, which is where this district ends, um, the buildings and site designs signal to you that you are entering downtown Northampton. Um, these areas are, areas are also really important for uh, their proximity to adjacent residential neighborhoods. So if somebody's going to walk from say Ward 3, um, come up Holyoke Street or Hockenham into downtown, um, they're going to walk through this district. And so this district has to, has to be walkable in order for there to be a connection between those residential neighborhoods and downtown um, that's functional and, and appealing. And so those nearby residents are not getting in their cars and walking to downtown. Um, so this area is good for providing increased options for housing and services um, and for re knitting the connections between those adjacent residential neighborhoods and downtown. Um, so a couple of just going through some of the possible standards um, we've been working on um, in terms of how do you zone for the public realm? So you, um, zoning can add standards for sidewalks, exactly what's required for sidewalks. Um, so there's no, no question when a project comes in. Um, you can add standards for tree planting. What's the minimum surface area required for a tree? What's the minimum soil depth required for a tree? Um, so that we can ensure that trees are not only planted, but planted in a way that they have a fairly good chance of survival. Um, adding standards for furnishings like um, bike racks and benches and so on. And finally, adding standards for, for the use of public space. So things like sidewalk dining or um, storefront displays. When you put a rack of products out in the street, you're using public space. So the zoning can set standards for that use private use of public space. Um, another key topic here is, is ground floor commercial. 
So the proposal is to continue to require ground floor commercial for the core, so Main Street and the very beginning of Pleasanton, but not to require ground floor commercial for side street in the gateway districts. Um, that's a change. Currently, um, Central Business District does require ground floor commercial. So um, you have examples like the Masonic Lodge that um, requires ground floor commercial use and the building may not actually be very well suited for ground floor commercial use. Or like the, um, the law office you see down the street from the Masonic Lodge where the building was designed for um, a restaurant space sat empty for a long time is currently being used for a lawyer, but the way the building is designed um, isn't that suitable for a lawyer, right? If the windows had been a little higher, they'd probably feel a little bit more sense of privacy and not be inclined to put their shades down all the time, which is kind of defeating the purpose of those big windows. Um, so there's, there are standards to deal with that kind of thing. Um, and then um, having standards to ensure that the frontages are still pedestrian friendly, even if the ground floor doesn't have an active commercial use. Um, so adding standards for building characteristics, um, clarifying and illustrating the things that are currently in the zoning for the central business districts and moving standards that are objective from the central business architecture design standards to the zoning while leaving subjective ones in the architectural guidelines or standards. Um, so the zoning will establish basic standards for building massing, like how big is a building, how, um, how long can a, there be an unbroken mass of building before you need to have some sort of surface variation. Um, adding upper floor step backs. So the front of the building comes up along the street and then the upper floor might be required to step back so that there isn't quite as much street enclosure. So you get more light in and you don't have a sense of being claustrophobic. Um, having standards for blank walls, um, not allowing more than a certain percentage or a certain area of the front facade of a building to be a blank wall um, and requiring pedestrian entrances. So that's currently required in the central business district, but it's not required in the um, general business district, which is on Lower Pleasant and Con Street. Um, and then applying the forms districts as well to the gateway. And then finally, um, central business architecture review. The idea is to keep the central business architecture committee review for the core, but to not have um, that committee review projects outside of the historic core. So areas that become the side street and, and also then apply to the gateway district um, where it currently doesn't. And as I said before, you're gonna move all the objective standards from the CBAC to the zoning and update the CBAC design standards. Okay. Um, I hope that you guys are still awake here, closing in at 9.30. Um, so we're gonna open it up for discussion in a minute. Um, Carolyn, I wanna check with you first if anybody has chatted any comments in if you want to go through those comments or questions by chat. Um, no, so I ha haven't received anything in um, the chat at all. So. Okay. Um, so feel free to chat to Carolyn or I, preferably Carolyn. Um, um, we don't want there to be a lot of chat conversation because we prefer everybody actually converse with their voices so we can all hear each other. Um, so. I'm gonna open it up for just general discussion. Um, you know, the first question is, does this, does the underlying rationale for the zoning changes that I described make sense to you? In other words, do those planning ideas make sense that the zoning should have the flexibility to respond to changes in market demands? Um, and that, for example, requiring ground floor commercial um, throughout the downtown might be too much. Um, or that we should focus on the public realm, or that there should be more predictability in the zoning, or that the zoning should be tailored to uh, the diverse existing character and desired character of these areas. Um, so feel free to respond to any of these questions or any other thoughts you may have. 
Uh, I see Joel Russell. Go ahead, Joel. Why don't you unmute yourself? Okay. Um, well, thank you. First of all, I, I'm really glad to hear this presentation. I, I think it was really well done. And, and I, I strongly agree with the underlying rationale for this, um, particularly on, on the what you're calling the side street areas and the gateway, because uh, Main Street really has its pretty well-defined character. Um, but the real opportunity seems to me is in those side streets. And I think it's really important that you distinguish those and, and are creating a different set of standards. Clear whether you were going to be encouraging a lot more residential development on the side streets, because it seems that's really where the market opportunity is and that's what we need to have to help support business in the downtown. So I, I hope you'll be doing that. Um, and, but otherwise, I think this is really a positive step in the right direction. Um, this is the kind of change in the zoning that will really help uh, downtown Northampton going forward. Any other comments, questions, thoughts, concerns? I, I agree the flexibility is good. I think given the sort of quite uncertain future <laughs> of uh, both you know medium and long term um, in the downtown area, I think we heard uh, for anyone who was on the Main Street redesign forum, there's clearly a um, wide range of ideas about what downtown should be. Um, you know, whether you split it economically, generationally. Um, so the more flexibility, the better. Um, I guess, I mean, as an architect, I focus on, you know, what makes <laughs> the designer's job harder, I guess. But, um, you know, I'm just always put in a plea for making uh, fewer but more sensible um, thinking about breaks. I know you're always trying to guard and quote bad design, uh, but you know, that's just always something I think is important to think about. That is the, um, that's the challenge. It's how to know what's enough so that you have an area that meets the desired vision and not have so much that it's too restrictive. Um, you kind of flashed through, you were flashing through the plans a lot with the existing and proposed zoning. Is, I, I can't seem to find that on the website. Is that, or can you just like go back to that? Yeah, the pinky, all the pink. Yeah, that's fine. See the over, well, I was wondering what's, what's with these like 10 houses yeah. over between Cons and Pleasant that are just, yeah, that are just not part of the pink zone. Um, so those are currently in. Um, those are URC, right? URC, yep. And so the, the changes are on, yeah, just currently are not contemplating main, making changes to the URC areas there. So you're tasked with looking at things that were already in general business or uh, central business. Okay. Uh, do you want to speak to that? Not to put you on the spot. I mean, I think the idea is basically over, um, that that's a whole other kind of question is whether those areas should be um, included in a business district when they're currently residential. Um, so there are some intact neighborhoods in there like on Wilson Ave, that's a, you know, it's a residential street. Um, Can you go back to the actual proposed zoning? Sorry. Sure. Thanks. So this here, Wilson Ave is a, you know, residential street. Mm -hmm. I mean, we yeah. just saw, I mean, Carolyn, you, you, I mean, you obviously know this, but like we just heard, I think like two or three different hearings that were sort of um, complicated, I think, in this, this triangle between cons and pleasant. I think because of this issue of like uncertain, like the people who live in the single family homes think it's a single family neighborhood, but it's getting it's getting hit on all sides. And I'm sure it's, it's the most sensitive of sensitive issues. 
but isn't it a moment to like take a stand and saying like this is what this should be and not pretend like these little eight houses are like the neighborhood and i mean or have a vision for like this area <laughs> like that's more than just i don't know yeah. that seems like an outlier to me so I think, um, I mean, you know, as Dylan mentioned, we were looking at sort of the existing commercial districts and the central business, um, of course, central business, and then those gateways that let the commercial gateways that lead into the central business district. I think it definitely warrants a large, a bigger conversation about do we want to expand the central business district um, and, and in this case, so as it's showing that maybe the CB side district um, designation for that sort of donut hole there. Um, however, sort of moving this forward now doesn't preclude looking, taking more time to look at what makes sense to bring those um, pockets that haven't really been, um, you know, we haven't done any kind of strategic planning specifically for expanding the central business district into these pockets. So um, I think the goal right now, we've been working on this for a year, two years. Um, and, and even before that, um, we are working with the central business architecture committee on actually updating the design um, criteria. Um, so I think right now the goal is to um, go ahead and make that transition for the whole of the commercial um, core and, and commercial districts um, and then come back and say, okay, we've done this. Um, does it make sense to expand? And we also want to make sure we're um, allowing for um, market changes and not um, um, and not necessarily pushing um, new intense development where there may not be opportunities for that on these, uh, particularly, let's say, um, um, Wilson or um, the other side street there that might not have a lot of development potential now anyway, and just focus on where we might have opportunities. Is some of the idea of maybe like the gateway zone or the side street zone could be more responsive or contextual to make it less of a lift if you ever do want to do a rezoning it's less of an abrupt uh it's less of a sense of, uh <laughs> i don't know how to say it it's less of an issue i guess if you have a medium sort of zone between uh urc and central business i guess yeah right makes sense um so two a couple of people have raised their hands, so I'm going to call on the people who haven't spoken first. Um, so, Lee. Um, I wonder if there's been any conversation or, or thought about creating a pedestrian-only section somewhere in downtown Northampton. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I think it's a little out side of this conversation, which is more focused on private developments and the um, areas within the sidewalks, basically, between the front of the building and the curb. Um, so if there was a plan for a pedestrian only area in Northampton, um, the zoning could respond to that and take that in consideration. But um, until that's plan is in place. Um, I yeah, I mean, I guess just to add to that there, you know, this is a plan about sort of the development on the private side and what happens from the back of the curb back to the building. So that wouldn't necessarily change, even if there was another decision through another, um, you know, process that looked at the way the street between the curbs is is um, treated. So whether that's um, you know modifying the geometry of the street itself or changing the patterns along the street, that's a different um, that's a different discussion and doesn't really wouldn't um, significantly affect what we're doing on the zoning side or the private development side. Leah, yeah, I'm curious whether you're talking about like a pedestrian mall you know, taking an existing street and con converting it to pedestrian only, or you're talking about 
you know, substantial new development that doesn't have streets for cars, you know, taking a very large parcel or set of parcels that are redeveloped um, with only walking streets. Um, well, I, I don't know that I have a preference of one or the other of what you described, um, but I, I, do, I do feel as though um, towns that have created an area that is pedestrian only, it becomes a real magnet. I, I think, in, you know, and there's examples of that in other places. Um, so I, I would hope that any zoning um, decisions that were made now wouldn't uh, adversely uh, affect the ability of Northampton to go in that direction later on, yep. if, if they decide to. Right, yeah, and I, I don't think this would. Okay, um, Eric B has their hand up. Yeah, hi. Um, so thinking about the gateways, so one of the things that you know I, I think is a concern is, is how do you set up the zoning to encourage architecture that's consistent with you know the city and the region and kind of discourage you know the whole corporate duplication of their 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 style that you know that you find in every town and city in, in America how do you preserve the character of our area in these areas and that's probably a hard thing to do but that that's something that you know I think would be worth striving for and then the second thing I have is I'm hoping that the form based criteria doesn't lock in specific eras of architectural style, you know, pseudo colonial or 1920s or 1890s. But this is another kind of subjective hard area. But, um, you know, we, we have some nice mid century buildings in town and things like that. So I'm, I'm hoping that there's that kind of flexibility. It, you know, we don't have to try to reproduce or be locked into a specific era or architectural styles, but that there's, there is a, a reasonable range. I mean, obviously a, a glass box tower would be way out of place, at least you know, right on the on Main Street, but um, uh, am I uh, conveying that clearly? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yep. Okay. So that's just- um, Yeah, I'm, I'm curious how other people feel about that question. It's certainly something we've talked about of how um, prescriptive to make architectural design standards, how far to go into that. Um, so I'm curious what other people think. Yeah, and I really hate that fake duplication of early, you take an earlier concept or something, you know, Georgian or something, but you make this big monstrosity that's all the proportions are blown out of whack and stuff. And it's, it's yeah, it's, you know, the Las Vegas type of thing or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> you know, yeah. The um, car caricatures, yeah, we don't want caricatures of, of architecture. We want, we want to maintain yeah. our Pioneer Valley um, character. Yeah. Does, does anybody else want to speak to that question? It looks like Joel does. Yeah, just quickly, I mean, it seems to me that you can have different levels of architectural standards for different places. Main Street would have a much different standard, but you can have in the side street or, or gateway areas, you can have um, standards that are based more on, on general form of building so that, so that you don't have those corporate styles that people are concerned about. You, you can't mandate non-corporate, but you can, can put in things about the form of the building that definitely Yeah, and I, th I think that's basically the conclusion that we've come through in developing the draft is that um, there'll be the most architectural design standards for the core, right? And that's part of the reason for shrinking it to the core is that that area has historic, it has an integrity of historic architecture. It's got uh, a small range of building types. Um, even within it, there's incredible diversity. Um, but so there's the idea there is to, to maintain that historic integrity, but then to allow more flexibility in the remainder of the central, what's currently the central business district and on the gateways. Um, while still paying attention to just getting the basics right, the basics of site design and the basics of, of building design. 
um, and very much focusing on the interface between the front of the building and the sidewalk, right? So um, caring mostly about the facade of the building and its general bulk and massing and not so much about what's happening in the back of the building. Um, so that's a, the, the approach that the, was taken with, with um, Live or Live 155, of getting the name right, the new building on, Ple on Pleasant Street where the front is kind of a traditional building that is in keeping with the character of Main Street, but the back is a contemporary multicolored party of a building. Any other comments or questions? Let me go back to my list of questions. So I'll I'll jump in for a minute, Dylan. This Great. is George. Um, a lot of things. That this has uh, provoked a lot of things in me. I, I think what I'm most aware of is the real the change in retail, certainly yeah. um, not just here in Northampton, but probably across our country. That happened was happening even before COVID, because of the. Uh, you know, all of the online shopping and perhaps um, uh, other factors that I'm not aware of. So I'm wondering about it. I love the idea of flexibility, but as we expand the flexibility down the side streets, um, creating more retail opportunities down there, I wonder if then uh, the business community might be worried about diluting um, the kind of clustering of retail on Main Street, which um, certainly is the draw for the um, the walkability, the people coming into town. So, you know, that's one variable or one big factor nowadays. But on the other hand, I know another big thing that we're all learning from COVID is how many people are enjoying working from home. Um, so these, these um, transitional neighborhoods, even where I live down on State Street or over on Market Street, I could see where more and more people may want to work from home and perhaps create smaller offices. I'm not in tune with what uh, our building department or the zoning allows completely around home offices, but I see much more of that perhaps happening in the future. Um, so, so I guess it's a plug for the flexibility and, and some of that is flexibility around use rather than design. Um, and I know we want to, I'm a big proponent in maintaining the walkability of, of the downtown. And, uh, and, I, and I know that that's what the attraction is for Northampton and one of its biggest strengths um, and how that competes with parking lots and parking uh, accessibility to parking. Um, so that's a little bit muddled. I'm, uh, I'm there with Eric. I'm not sure I'm making myself clearly known, but I think what we're looking at so far really uh, helps me to see what the next 20 or 30 years of a downtown Northampton might be and these different little arteries. Um, and, and I'm very interested in these side streets and what they might look like um, given this kind of evolution of uh, commerce in Northampton, I guess, and um, how people make a living. So, so thanks for bringing all these slides and uh, and causing me all these thoughts. <laughs> Thanks for sharing them. Yeah, I mean, what I'm hearing you say is there's a lot of uncertainty, which is, I think, um, right on. There's, um, you know, there was, there was already shrinking retail um, office. Who knows what's gonna happen with office space after we work from home for, as people work from home for an extended period of time. Um, so I think it reinforces the need to allow more flexibility of use, particularly on the ground floors outside of that core area. Um, so Melissa has their hand up. Melissa, is there something you wanna say? Yeah, thank you, Dylan. Um, um, uh, I continuously ask myself, um, what economic goals or themes that would be harmonious with the city's goals. And as a resident of 28 years, I envision uh, the downtown businesses 
to provide um, potential, like a technical sub hub of Boston or something like that, something intellectual, thought provoking jobs for graduates um, in the area and of the five colleges while maintaining the current character. So, um, for example, developing the landmark buildings such as um, St. Mary's Church and the other churches that are surrounding. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I hear you. Yeah. I mean, I think that question of what's what's the. Um, I think I used to work at the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, so I thought a lot about the region. Um, just, um, clearly, bringing more jobs to the to the broader region, including Northampton, is very important, and figuring out how to capitalize on recent graduates and the um, highly educated people who are in this area, as well as providing jobs for people who aren't as highly educated. So um, hopefully, I think that, you know, maybe the, the good test is, will the zoning prevent that from happening? And is there anything the zoning can do to facilitate it? Thank you. Anybody else have anything to say? Um, Joel. I hope you're not sick of hearing from me. I just, I really wanted to respond to something David Whitehill said at the beginning um, the, about those those pockets of residential, pre-existing residential development. I just think having written a number of form-based codes myself, I think there are some ways to deal with that, um, to think about it anyway. Uh, one is, in the textual provision in the code, you, you can have carve outs for, for, for certain characters of certain areas. Um, and so there can be things in the text that protect the interests of existing homeowners and existing neighborhoods. Or you can do something similar with just a separate subdistrict, say the residential neighborhood subdistrict within the downtown, um, and then have a set of rules that reflects the pattern that's there um, and respects it and protects the people in that area. So, and it could always eventually be changed into another district if the need arises. Just a suggestion. Yeah, thanks, Joel. I value your opinion, as you know. Um, yeah, I think that, so part of the, the way that the this, this zoning draft was written, um, it was designed to enable it to be expanded over time to additional areas. Um, so I think that, you know, the, the thing is you gotta do the planning first. You have to figure out what you want before you can write the standards and know what the city wants. Um, at the same time, the URC has flexibility for probably a lot of what people want. Um, it has some sort of basic standards that are encouraging appropriate development. Um, so I, I don't know that there's much in terms of, of use that's, that people, that you would find a consensus for additional uses in those areas um, beyond what's currently allowed. But again, you need to do the planning first. So overall, does this seem like it's heading in the right direction? Yes, see one yes. <laughs> you know, one quick question, the, the predictability. Um, I think what you're alluding to there is when someone, a developer comes in or an architect that wants to do some work on a building. Um, and certainly we want to encourage that to happen more and more. And I don't know if there's been any recent situations where our current zoning and our current procedures have really hindered that from happening. And if that's been one of the um, instigators of these changes. Is it I think the idea with predictability is, 
Um, there's a couple aspects of predictability. There's the predictability of moving, uh, making, making most uses by right with site plan approval. So it's predictable. You are going to get your permit as long as you meet the criteria. Um, so that's one aspect of predictability. The other is a predictability for the abutters and for the city as a whole that the development um, meets their basic idea of, of our vision of what we want for the city. Um, in terms of whether the zoning is, whether a lack of predictability is slowing development, I think that's the kind of thing you can't really know, um, except anecdotally, what if people have said, well, I was thinking about doing a project, but it just seems like such a hassle and I don't know if it's gonna get approved, so I'm not gonna spend the money. Um, so there may be some anecdotes, but you also don't know who just never brought their plan to Carolyn for consideration. Um, but, and I think, um, uh, George, I think that there is um, particularly a more of an element of that unpredictability as it relates to the areas that are outside of the Main Street core, because those buildings and um, the character of those blocks are different from Main Street. So applicants don't know, am I going to be held to the same standard? Do I have to do you know, um, facade changes to match what's on Main Street. If I don't propose that, am I gonna get a permit from the Central Business Architecture Committee? Um, there was a lot of confusion recently over the, um, when we had the conversation on Con Street about the rezoning of the World War II Club and um, people were confused about what that would mean in terms of renovations to that building. And that's, I mean, anecdotally, that's one example, but I think that plays out a lot throughout the sort of the areas outside of Main Street about what's, what's to be expected. So one of the big goals is to say, okay, we know that we have these different characters, but characteristics, but we want to allow the intensity of downtown. We wanna make sure we're continuing to create um, the vibrancy and support for businesses downtown by allowing you know, more flexibility with residential, um, more residential intensity, but also in a way that's not um, um, going to require the same permitting level or permitting review that a re um, development or addition on Main Street would, would um, trigger. Um, so there is a, uh, one of the things that we'd like to start moving forward on is really just getting these changes um, adopted so that um, we it so that we're sending that message to people that you know we're we're really trying to encourage um, development in this core area and we want to make sure it's as easy as possible but while still meeting the goals of the city um, in that regard I mean everything like sorry. I was just gonna, I was just going to say that anything you can do to reduce the requirement for commercial and retail in in multifamily uh, developments near the urban core is great because I know that that just eats away at the pro forma and makes the the housing cost more to the residents and and just you know and then we have empty storefronts you know so I think we could do with a lot of I mean the side street I think is a great idea and to allow you know designers to be creative about how you shield those things from the public way. It's fantastic. Great. That seems like it's in the right direction. Uh, right. So I don't know if Dylan, I mean, there, we did official poll questions that I don't know if people will be interested in responding to, but it might be good to, since we haven't gotten a lot of verbal feedback, maybe if people feel like they want to respond to the poll, um, that would be great. So I can um, put that up there for people just to take a couple minutes before we wrap up. Does that make sense, Dylan? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, if you have something you want to say, but you don't want to speak, feel free to chat it to us as well. 
Right. Um, so these are very basic questions, but we just wanted to get some simple feedback um, um, about um, where this is going. And the reason for that is, I mean, we think we heard from previous um, public forums going, you know, after we sort of took this hiatus for COVID, that um, this was something that was desired and we'd like to move it forward. We know there's interest in making some of these in some development that would result in residential on the ground floor in areas that we think makes sense. So we'd like to start moving this forward, you know, at the beginning of the year with some actual zoning text changes. Um, so long as, you know, we're getting the sense that we're still moving in the right direction. So I'm just gonna push this um, out there to you all um, and just take a couple of minutes and respond to those questions. And we'll throw those into the pile um, as we evaluate sort of how we um, fine tune this um, process and the code. Mine is a press submit. Well, the results are coming in, so I think you probably did the right thing. <laughs> um, if you don't answer all the questions, it won't allow you to submit. So make sure you scroll down to the bottom. There are seven questions. I'm sorry, real, real quickly, what is the, uh, the public realm standard? Yeah, so the public realm standards are, are standards that relate to um, what developers need to do to bring the sidewalks, street trees, et cetera, up to the level that the city wants um, if they disturb those areas. Um, so that's one aspect of it. And the other aspect of how is, is the design of the area, if any, between the front of the building and the edge of the public right of way. Um, so that's standards that might. Um, so it might be if you're doing a, if you're required to plant trees in front of the building, what kind of um, filter box is required? What, ha, what kind of soil is required to support that tree for the long-term health of that tree? Or what kind of uh, bench should be installed in front of the building if that's going to be required between the, you know, the front of the building and the back of the curb, sort of how that area, how that interface between the public and private um, portion um, of the street um, should look and feel. So we will get in, in, in future, in the future, we'll get into more details of exactly what those are. The, question tonight is just, does that seem like generally a good idea to be having the zoning address that set of concerns, right? So the zoning addresses parking. I ask you whether zoning should address parking, you're probably gonna say yes. Zoning doesn't always address the public realm. In fact, most of the time it's, it's not establishing very clear standards for the public realm besides just, here's your minimum front setback. Um, so the question is, is it a good idea to have the zoning have standards for that topic? So the planning board, and Sam, I can't remember if you were on the board at this time, but the planning board, um, you know, reviewed the Live 155 project, and there's a whole, there's a seating area in front of that that has, um, you know, um, trees and sort of a granite wall that can be doubled as a seating area. That was all sort of developed with a conversation, through a conversation with the applicant. Instead of having clear standards, applicant didn't know going in what might be appropriate in that area. So if there were standards for public realm, then um, the applicants would know going in, okay, this is the type of seating I need to provide, or this is not appropriate, or this is how many trees I really need to think about given the space I have between the back of the curb and my building. Um, and this is how I need to plant them um, so that 
all of that is clear up front, um, established at the outset. I mean, I love the idea of it, it being clear and established. It, it, there's sort of a, in one sense, I'm scared about the cost associated with, with, with what the clear, what uh, clear things I would like to be, I would like in the zoning rules. I mean, right. I this is, it, yeah. I mean, this is also relates to when you when you touch the public way, how do you fix it? Yeah, so yeah. it's no, not necessarily it. adding an expense um, automatically to everyone who comes into a building. It's really if you're asking for something above and beyond what sort of a by right, you know, um, yeah. development yeah. is, then here's what you have to do. Yeah. I, think, I mean, I, I think it's great. I'm I'm excited and. You know, I'd love, I'd love to, uh, I'd love to hopefully see this, see this happen and beautify uh, much of, much of King Street, which is so unattractive. <laughs> All right. Uh, do you want to end, I'm, Carolyn, I'm going to end your poll for you. Okay. Yep. Um, and share the results. So. It looks like um, you all say, everybody responded said the zoning's heading in the right direction. Um, everybody said they generally support the planning goals. Um, the vast majority think that establishing new districts and changing the district boundaries is a good idea. Um, two people are undecided on that one. Um, I think one person was undecided on ground floor commercial outside the core of downtown and 14 were in favor of that. Um, 11 were in favor of adding public realm standards and four were undecided. Um, so I think when we get clear about what those are, you'll be able to make a decision about whether you think that's appropriate or not. Um, 12 were in support of adding building design standards for Lower King and Pleasant. One was opposed and two were undecided. And 13 were in support of shrinking the area subject to CBAC review um, with two undecided. Um, so thank you for, for filling that out. It's really helpful to just get a pulse of the people who are in the room virtually um, and you know gives us a sense of where we need to focus future conversations and future work. So what I think unless there are any further comments, we're done. Just quickly, I'm wondering if you would be willing to share these slides. I know for myself, my brain just isn't particularly fresh right now and I'd love a chance to just sort of uh, look at the map again and, and just sort of digest this all later. So is there a way we can get access to the slide deck? Yep. That'd be great. And, um, yeah, we'll put it on the... Um... We'll put it on a link on our front page and I'll send out the link to the planning board members as well. Thank you. All right. I don't know what you guys have in the rest of your night, but I think I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dylan. Thanks, Dylan. Thank nice. you, Peter. Thank you. Does the planning board have anything else going, Carolyn? Um, so we just have um, minutes, I believe, and we don't have any A and R's. Can't, and I don't think there's anything else. So it's really just the minutes. Yeah, I don't know if you sent us any recent minutes. I didn't send them out. Okay, so we don't have minutes. They're done. I guess I just didn't hit send on that last email. Um, what, what beach are you at, Carolyn? <laughs> I'm not there now, actually. Maybe I'll just quit that. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> oh, it's over. Right. I like to go <laughs> so I'm, I'm sad just... that you did that, Carolyn. <laughs> please, please go back. <laughs> Just a reminder, if folks still have energy, Carolyn, there's a 
a public forum coming up on the downtown on right. Florence. That's Florence, right, right on the seventeenth. Yep. So that's Tuesday, um, six thirty. There's nothing else on the agenda but that. <laughs> um, but the idea is to look at that um, Florence, and then actually in December. So the form-based code would include a section for Florence Center and a section for downtown um, Northampton. So that in December, I think we're gonna take a deeper, more detailed look at the actual zoning piece of it for both of them. Um, so, and, and to look at how it comes together as one package, because the idea would then be to submit it to the council at the beginning of the year as a set of um, zoning amendments. And Carolyn, the other kind of forum, the, the other night there was the Main Street Redesign Forum, which was only 135 people came out, surprise. Some planning board members were there, but the planning board ourselves, we haven't had a chance to kind of talk about it or perhaps make any recommendations. Um, and I don't know if that's appropriate for us before the 25% design comes through, but. I don't know if there's a placeholder for us and the consultants to kind of talk about the Main Street redesign. Yes. Um, so um, we're we definitely internally need to regroup about um, sort of uh, the the comments or concerns raised. I mean, you know, there wasn't um, there definitely wasn't consensus on um, on much. Um, so I think um, we need to sort of figure out what we do with that information um, and then, you know, take it to the next step. But of course, before it totally makes sense to, to come back and, and bring you guys back in um, as, it, as we figure out sort of what we're gonna do um, in the next step. But um, yeah, so yeah, great. a what's, lot of work. The, yeah. What's been helpful for me in the past couple of weeks, I've talked to a couple of business owners that I know and a couple that I don't know about the whole kind of process. So if any of my planning board colleagues have friends out there on Main Street or on the side streets who are running businesses, it would be great to try to have a little conversation. I feel sometimes we're like the, the Biden Trump foes now, you know? that there's no conversation going on between these two camps. So I want to make sure that at least personally, I hear from some of them. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was struck by the uh, uh, polarization, I guess you could call it. I think it's hard to I mean, I kind of I think I said this at the last meeting. I think it's exactly the wrong time to have a, a, a civil conversation about this. Just people across the board in the business world are all worried about going under. So they can't, they can't think about this in a vacuum. Um, they're all worried about losing their businesses. So I just don't see how, I mean, it's fine to push ahead, but I just think it, it'll get a lot of really angry business people right now. So I would think that we have to wait until, you know, <laughs> the vaccine is in full distribution or something to, to really have a civil conversation about it. And maybe the state will see that and not, you know, change the schedule or something with the money. I just, it just seems poisonous right now. But that was, you know, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, it's definitely not an easy time. No, no. So motion to adjourn. So moved. Seconded. All right. Uh, quickly around the horn. I see Alan, I think left us. Um, Sam, I'm he voted with it. his feet. <laughs> Go. Okay. All right, David. Yes. And Jana. Yes. And Melissa. Yes. Marissa. Yes. Okay, it's unanimous at ten ten. Thank you, Carolyn. Thanks Thank everybody you. for hanging Thanks, in everybody. there. Good night, y'all. See you soon. Bye. Hey, Carolyn. Bye. Yeah. I just want to say I'm so impressed by how um, calmly and sort of um, 
informationally you respond to various people's comments. I just think you do a really good job of sort of piping up with helpful things without sort of seeming too biased one way or the other and just giving us and applicants and, and members of the public useful information that, that um, helps move the conversation along. And anyway, just thank you for that. I was particularly oh, aware of yeah. it tonight. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Don't always here, here. get that feedback. <laughs> so thanks. Yeah. Anyway, that's all. Good night. Okay. Great. Good night. Thanks.